Hello friends, I'm Will Meneker, and welcome to the inaugural episode of my new podcast that I'll be doing with my fellow movie sicko, Hessa Denny. Hello. To christen this voyage into movies, we've selected for our first episode two films that highlight one of the most powerful partnerships between a director and a leading man of our times. Today, we're talking about Tony Scott and Denzel Washington, and two of their collaborations, Deja Vu from 2007 and Man on Fire from 2004. The ultimate auteur of the action thriller meets the ultimate American leading man. Now, Tony Scott is often talked about in connection to his older brother, Ridley. In the past, he's been considered the more sensationalistic, less mature version of his older brother. But for our purposes, Tony's films stand on their own, and we don't need to engage in the canned debate about which brother is better. <coughs> it's Tony. Indeed, critical consensus on Tony Scott has evolved beyond the shadow of Ridley, and certainly since his death in 2012, people rightly have come around to regarding him as one of the true auteurs of big Hollywood action entertainment. Unfortunately, any discussion of his body of work is bittersweet and colored by his suicide and the question of just how much more he could have done. On a personal note, I've visited Tony Scott's grave at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Los Angeles seven, several times. His gravestone is a remarkable slab of marble that on its rough, uncut plane uh, features a sculpted figure of a mountain climber scaling the face of an enormous cliff with just one rope tethering him to his ascent. It's a striking memorial that also features on the smooth side, chiseled into the slab of marble itself, a full list of his directing credits, beginning with one of, if not the first sexy modern vampire movie, The Hunger in 1983. And then, of course, the homoerotic military mega blockbuster Top Gun in 1986. Scott used an eye honed directing TV commercials and music videos to redefine big budget studio filmmaking and create lush, dreamy pop action entertainment on the biggest possible scale. His style of movie maximalism has always been sensational and dedicated to pushing the limits of just how fun, sexy and entertaining movies can be while always staying very much grounded in the present and in the real world and real people who find themselves in the danger zone. His movies can be cynical, dark, and even nasty at times, while always maintaining a sense of humor and a certain warmth and humanism. And to that end, it's in Denzel Washington that he finds his perfect collaborator, an actor that defines a kind of approachable American everyman. Think our generation's Paul Newman but one whose performances still convey a wry humor and often hidden fissures, darkness, and vulnerabilities that he lets his audience in on. Starting with Crimson Tide in 1995, the Scott Washington collaboration would lie fallow until 2004's Man on Fire, which we'll be discussing today. Following that, in an almost rapid succession, the two would make Deja Vu, The Taking of Pelham 123, and Scott's final movie, Unstoppable, in 2010. It's over the course of these films that we see Scott fully develop and define the distinctly hyperkinetic style that would come to define what Hessa and I call Tony Vision, or going Scott mode. In a marked departure from the dreamier visual grammar of his earlier films like Top Gun or The Last Boy Scout, we see in the two films we're going to discuss today, Scott's fully idiosyncratic and even experimental style, one marked by extremely high contrast and severely saturated colors, along with a whole host of processing tricks on top of the visuals. Double exposures, flash frames, rolling, strobing exposures, and most importantly, those deep fried overcooked colors. It's this constant evolution of style and use of the biggest, most expensive canvas possible to perfect it that makes him such an interesting and awesome filmmaker and the subject of this episode. As for Denzel, what more can I say? He's the man. He's great in everything, and sorry to Malcolm X and Training Day heads out there, but my personal favorite Denzel role is John motherfucking Creasy. Born January 4th, 1956. Died January 16th, 2003. Without any further ado, this is movie mindset. It's a phenomenon known as deja vu. It's a phenomenon 
known as Deja Vu. You arrive at a place you've never been. But it feels familiar. But it feels familiar. You look into the face of a stranger. And you feel like you've known her all your life. Have we met? Yeah. Yeah, we have. He has been shown a secret. It's a brand new program. We can look anywhere four days in the past. The government doesn't want you to know. This is not surveillance. This is the actual past. Yes. This Thanksgiving, the key to stopping a disaster. You think you know what's coming? You don't have a clue. Starts by unraveling the mystery of deja vu. What if you had to tell someone the most important thing in the world, but you knew they'd never believe you? I try. Tessa, just to begin, how would you how would you describe the works of Tony Scott? I think Tony Scott has like a very sexual kind of style in like a weird way especially his like earlier works that kind of like the hunger his first movie very sexual oh. very sexual and like very there's a homoeroticism that underpins a lot of his movies that i think is really you know wonderful i think um top gun being the yeah the, 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 the object uh, example there yeah the ex- literal example <laughs> of a homoerotic movie playing with the boys <laughs> <laughs> and um I think, and like Days of Thunder, obviously, and I think that he's like a fantastic craftsman and like director of action, especially. I think he's definitely an action director. Yeah. Whereas, you know, like, I don't know, like Ridley Scott is more, he can direct action, but he's more focused on the characters and, or Christopher Nolan, who is more focused on the science and the, you yeah. know, the minutia of things. Like... If you compare like Tenet and Deja Vu, which I'm sure we will at some point during this, they're they're two very, very different movies. There's a lot more explaining going on in Tenet and a lot more action. Even, well, we'll talk about it when we get to the movie, but in Deja Vu, there's this brilliant thing where like the explaining and the kind of the explaining and the narration of what's going on becomes the action because they're kind of controlling this camera in the past, but... Yeah, I think he's very action-minded and he does it in a way that no one else really does. And he's so responsible for the way a lot of movies look today. Absolutely. And, like, the, the other thing, like, I mean, look, like, we're, we're all, he's always going to be compared to his older brother, Ridley. I have been on record saying that he is the more talented Scott brother. But we, we don't, we don't need, the Tony, Scott, Tony Scott's movies can stand on their own. They don't need to be compared to Ridley. Um, but, like, a, a, another major element of his movies is, like, like an action thriller auteur is this really like lightly worn humanism and warmth that I think they all have. And another I think another key thing is that his action heroes are always ordinary guys. Mm-hmm. Like there are, there's like, really blessedly his movies are mostly free of CGI. Like most of his effects come from his editing techniques and like uh, the film saturation techniques he uses. Um, but I would say that like, his films are always grounded in the real world. And there are, there, are, there are ordinary men who do extraordinary things, be it, you know, Pete Maverick Mitchell and Top Gun, or, as we see here, in the perfect match of director with star, his, like, the, like the, the archetypal sort of American everyman in Denzel Washington. Mm-hmm. So, like, as a, what, what do you make of, like, Denzel, like, Denzel, his acting persona as a whole, and then, like, his particularly fruitful collaborations with Tony Scott, of which he's made five films with Tony Scott, most of them in the 21st century. Well, I think, like, Denzel is, he is, like, kind of an everyman, but he's, like, the, er, like, the ubermensch everyman, kind of, in the way that I think, like, Hitchcock saw Cary Grant as, you know, this guy who could be any of us, but with a little bit more swag. <laughs> and I think that Denzel it's is how like, it's, it's who we all want to be. Exactly. But it's an attainable goal. Exactly. Rather than someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Tom Cruise. Yeah. Like in, um, you know, there's like certain parts where he, there's a part in Deja Vu where he asks where the coffee pot is. And I remember the first time I saw that scene, I was like, God damn, this guy is so cool. <laughs> it's like, how do you ask for a coffee pot in a way that cool? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, And I think that that's, like, really put to use so well in, like, these movies and, like, Unstoppable, where he's just, like, a cool, 
older train engineer and like, you know, taking of Pelham 123 where he's a cool older train yeah. operator. <laughs> cool older train <laughs> operator. MTA employee. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, but there also, I feel like there's this theme with Denzel in Tony's films where he's, um, we don't really see it in Deja Vu, but um, where he's a man who in the past has done something wrong, you know, like in um, in Unstoppable, I think he's like demoted in um, Taking of Pelham 123. He takes a bribe in Japan and gets demoted. In Man on Fire, he has like a haunted past. Well, he's killed hundreds of people. Yeah, he's killed hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of CIA, people. Yeah. yeah. And I have a fun revelation from Man on Fire that I can't wait to tell you about uh, that I figured out. Well, let's get into them um, because, you know, we're, we're going slightly out of order here. Deja Vu was from 2007, Man on Fire from 2004. But I want to begin with Deja Vu. We were originally going to do um, Unstoppable because of the, you know, unbeatable news hook of a uh, trained uh, derailment uh, action thriller movie. Mm-hmm. But I'm actually really glad we ended up doing Deja Vu because this is sort of a, uh, a slightly, like, slept on Tony Scott movie. And mm-hmm. it's also... A movie that I think, like as as the first movie we're going to talk about on Movie Mindset, this was like a uh, a really a really pleasant uh, bit of uh, kismet that Hessa, you suggested we do this one instead of Unstoppable because I had sort of forgotten about this movie. But as I was watching it, I was like, "Here's my thesis. Yeah, <laughs> this is the thesis of Movie Mindset laid bare. This is a movie about how watching movies can change the past, and that through art we can even attempt to possibly even succeed in sending a message." from our present into the past, mm-hmm. thus changing our future. Changing the world by watching movies, Ch- truly. Exactly. <laughs> changing yourself and changing the world for the better through watching movies. Um, and for, like, we were going to do Unstoppable because, like, that's my favorite, I think, Tony Scott um, Denzel collaboration because I love, like, a good train, like, process movie. But then I was watching Man on Fire and I was like, we got to do Deja Vu because they these two kind of connect so well there's so many like i don't know the editing style of man on fire and um the editing that happens as part of the story in deja vu i think it's very like it's a good pairing yeah and like i just like a final thought on denzel washington before we start with uh deja vu i remember the uh, the film critic pauline kale once described um paul newman and what made him a great actor and she said something along the lines of that he is able to allow um, his audience to like even without without dialogue or like without like in character he is able to like allow his viewers access to a private vulnerability of the character he's portraying and I've always thought of Denzel Washington as sort of like our generation's Paul Newman mm-hmm. as this like you know like preternaturally handsome like classic American guy and like in in, in Deja Vu like and the, well Man on Fire is a little different because he's playing a a less likable character, but we'll get into that. And but both of these movies, I think, are a, a great vehicle for the great Denzel Washington and like the perfect match in his director, Tony Scott. I mean, people always talk about Denzel Washington and Spike Lee, but it is really all about Tony Scott and Denzel Washington. Mm-hmm. Right? Like they are like each other's perfect muse, and they've done such great work together. So let's just jump into it with uh, Deja Vu. Um, I will. I will. I should mention that De- both Deja Vu and Man on Fire have the same cinematographer, Paul Cameron, a Canadian guy who also did the cinematography for Collateral. So, Ooh. like we're seeing in Man on Fire, like like Tony pushing Tony Vision to like as far as it'll go, mm-hmm. and then a couple years later in Deja Vu, he is I, I think a little bit more constrained by Jerry Bruckheimer, um, but he is going to give you like just just enough of the Tony Scott vision and make a movie that is really about uh, what if technology could allow everyone access to Tony mode. And I I looked up the editors of these movies to see if they had the same editors, and they're two different editors, but they're the like the only two editors Tony Scott has ever used. Every single one of his movies is one of these guys or the other one, pretty much. Um, for the most part, I think there's like one or two outliers, but I thought that was really interesting that there are like two like editing muses that he uses, and they both you know created Tony Vision in such a wonderful way. I mean, like, and you gotta be like. You got to be a high level editor to work with Tony Scott because when he cranks up Tony Vision, oh yeah, the cuts come like a like it's like a freaking it's like a fucking blender. It's just, <laughs> but like I said, like usually um, that sort of like highly kinetic editing style is usually like evidence of a bad movie that like doesn't edit together well. Mm-hmm. But Tony Scott, like you, you mentioned how influential he is like to other directors. You can see like when the wheels come off that kind of style. But Tony is always in complete control, no matter how 
like completely spastic and um, per- perhaps a seizure inducing his movies can be at times. And, you know, we'll, st- we'll start with Deja Vu. Uh, this is back when movies are cool and they didn't, <laughs> they, they didn't warn you. They didn't warn epileptics before starting watching it. And I don't know if you noticed this. Uh, we get to see the, the, the classic uh, lightning hitting a tree, Jerry Bruckheimer logo. And it rewinds. It restarts. It, yeah. it, restarts <laughs> it restarts halfway through it. And folks, have that. You are, now, you are now in deja vu. You, yep. You're folks, having deja vu. Yeah, you're having deja vu. You've seen that logo before just five seconds ago. <laughs> so uh, the movie begins. Uh, it, it takes place in New Orleans. And uh, this was actually the, uh, the first. They, they originally. Uh, they had started production on this movie right before Katrina happened, and then they shut it down for like a year or two. And this was the uh, the first movie filmed back, like the first big Hollywood production filmed in post Katrina New Orleans. And we were treated in the opening images of this movie, like the the opening credits of this movie are the most Tony Vision part of the movie. Yeah, is like another key element of Tony Vision is his love of helicopters and like having them mm-hmm. on film, a sweeping, and then filming things with helicopters. Mm-hmm. There's the famous story about um. He uh, filmed this scene in Spy Game between Robert Redford and Brad Pitt where they're uh, having like a coffee together on the roof of some building in Prague. And then he was just like, all right, we're going to need a helicopter to just get a full 360 panorama around them. And the studio was like, why? There's no point in that. And he's like, okay, I'll pay for it out of pocket. So he just, he paid for his own helicopter to film a totally extraneous scene of just two guys talking on a roof. And it was just like sweeping around. He's so and cool. So like the, the movie begins and we're treated to the happiest images imaginable. Yeah, this, this is, opening is wild. It's very reminiscent of the face-off opening where yeah. <laughs> a kid gets fucking domed. By <laughs> so uh, keep in mind, like, this movie came out in 2007. And uh, I think I'm on a note uh, of note of these two movies as a double feature is I think that they're both in their own way very interesting sort of um, cultural receivers for what the George W. Bush era was about. Oh, absolutely. And this movie, Deja Vu, obviously deals with terrorism, but also this kind of like omnipresent surveillance state Mm -hmm. that rises around it. But like, crucially though, this is 2007. This is like right as the surge is still happening. The surge is happening. The surge was working back then, folks. (laughs) So he's giving you like, uh, this is like, this is a, a... a sort of a resurrected New Orleans, but the most important part about the imagery he's showing you in the beginning of this movie is that it is just hundreds of sailors piling onto a ferry, and it's Fat Tuesday, and Marty is... Not only sailors, but children. Yeah. There's like a, a two dozen children, like women, happy couples. Yeah. yeah. But but it's mainly like, it, it's, fo- it's like it's like VJ Day or something. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Woo! All right, boys, it's Fat Tuesday. Sailors, yeah. <laughs> sailors love boats of any kind. And like they're like, all right, boys, like they're on town. We got to get these boys to a brothel. It's, <laughs> it's Fat Tuesday in New Orleans. We've like got 500 <laughs> horny sailors. And Jack we, Nicholson <laughs> from the, the last detail. Yeah, <laughs> there, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so like, you know, and then keep in mind that like this is all being filmed. Like they're piling onto this huge uh, ferry. Um, uh and then, like, and Tony Scott is filming this in his, like, double exposure. He's zooming in. He's zooming out. You know, like, the, you've got, like, uh, like the smiling children. But, oh, wait, what's this? A girl drops her doll into the drink. Mm-hmm. A bad omen of things to come. Mm-hmm. And, of course, they're like, burr, burr. they're pulling that awesome fairy horn. Uh, they pull out. They're in the middle of uh, the Mississippi River. Was it Lake Pontchartrain or the Lake Mississippi River? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a New Orleans guy. Yeah. <laughs> please, please don't write in. <laughs> but all the, the, the no, like the, these these sailors and all the children with them, they will not be making it to the brothel mm-hmm. because <laughs> the ferry is blown the fuck up. And yeah. this is a really impressive piece of like pyrotechnic filmmaking. Yeah, and it's fucking, practical, right? Yeah, they blow the shit out of this ferry in the middle of New Orleans, <laughs> and it's a fucking enormous fireball. And then like it goes from like the good times of. You know, uh, uh, sa- backslap and sailors and children being like, "Mom, look, we're in New Orleans." To just bodies on fire being thrown like fucking yeah. rag dolls into the drink of of the Mississippi River, and uh, cars are being dumped in the water. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's nuts. And even before that, there's like another Tony Scott thing that's in both of these movies, which is like crazy use of diegetic sound and like pop music, like oh, yeah. being deployed, which like where um the beach boys don't worry baby is playing yes. in the in the uh truck with the bomb in it and a guy's like oh what's that sound i i better check it out and then <laughs> boom and keep in mind once again like a lesser filmmaker would have like yeah you'd see something blow up but because tony had pro- i think 
more helicopters than in the ride of the Valkyrie scene in Apocalypse yes. Now filming this explosion. <laughs> you see it from every conceivable angle. The camera is sweeping around. It's they're carnage everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, enter our hero, Denzel Washington, ATF agent Doug Carlin. Uh, he is there to survey the wreckage and the bodies. They got, you know, they got they're, they're, they're zippered up by the they're stacked up like cordwood on the dock. Mm -hmm. We get uh, another helicopter shot. But, you know, Denzel shows up, you know, he's in his element. He's a you know, he's an explosives expert with the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. But mm -hmm. I mean, bombs aren't involved in that. I don't really know what his job is. But we also learned that, like, uh, he investigated the Oklahoma City bomb. Yeah, they well. say Oklahoma City. Right. And he's like, uh huh. So, yeah, he, he participated in that cover up. <laughs> he's he's, <Yes. laughs> he's evil. <laughs> Um, so like, you know, he, he's been here before he's seen, you know, terrorist bombings blow up a ton of people and they're sort of like, well, uh, we still don't know if it's terrorism or not. It could just be something caught fire and, mm -hmm. and the very yeah. exploded. <laughs> and then he's like, uh, not so fast. I found like, you know, the, the bomb wiring and then, like, yeah. you know, I've got like I've smelled residue, fingers, bomb residue everywhere. I mean, this, the, he's a vet. He's, he's a pro. But here's mm -hmm. the interesting thing. Unlike the other scenages of terrorist carnage that uh, Denzel has been up before, he notices some sort of a uh, nerd looking gentleman walking around the crime scene with what looks to be VR goggles, like a VR goggle helmet at the scene of the crime. But mm -hmm. you know, doesn't think too much of it. He's, he doesn't think too much of that. He's got a job to do. So, all right, this is where we get the coffee pot scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, uh, this is, uh, yeah, he, he shows up and he's just like, how do you tell who, who's in charge of a, a, a massive multi uh, federal agency investigation? The guy who knows where the coffee is. Mm -hmm. And then, we were introduced, like, he's up under the uh, Crescent City Bridge. He's scoping out the scene. He needs the surveillance footage of the bridge. But who do we? Who shows up at this point? Another great reunion for Tony Scott. It's Val Kilmer. Mm -hmm. Back again. It's Iceman back in a Tony Scott movie. He is uh, an FBI agent who's looking for, like, a like a, a local a local guy to sort of liaise with this investigation. And he goes back, like, uh, so Denzel goes back to the ATF. Aha. Important. He's asked by a coworker, did that girl ever get in touch with you? Someone left a message for him on his uh, voicemail, and he calls back the number. They watch the uh, CTV footage of the bridge explosion up on the Crescent City Bridge, and they notice a guy on a motorcycle just sort of standing, watching, watching, yeah. watching the explosion. So they're like, mm, good chance that's, mm -hmm. that's our perp. Uh, we're then introduced to uh, Bruce Greenwood, is the uh, lead FBI, a, FBI agent in charge of uh, looking into just who killed these 543 men, women, children, and sailors. Um, and I like, I like at this point, though, they're like, okay, uh, where's Agent Carlin? And then, like, his coworker says, he's riding the streetcars. It's, it's part of his process. It helps him think. <laughs> so New Orleans. Them just, like, being like, <laughs> yeah. we love your city. Let's get these streetcars in here. So, and then, like, he's riding around in the streetcar doing his, uh, doing his agent thing, just sort of taking in the city, you know, like the... The, the lifeblood of the city. He has, he has to breathe it. He has to be on the streets to do his job. And he gets a phone call. A phone call about they discovered another burned up body that's washed up on the shore. But, but, it's, but due to the tides, they know it's, it's a, someone who was burned up kind of like in a similar way, but they washed up before the explosion. Mm -hmm. so, uh -huh. Then he goes, goes to the morgue and we're introduced to the, the corpse of Paula Patton. The beautiful corpse. The, the, the sexiest victim Glowing, of, a, of yeah. a burning ever, <laughs> ever, ever portrayed, ever. She's uh, missing in, she's missing fingers on her right hand. They say the, the, the killer like doused her in like diesel and set her on fire. But her, her gorgeous face yeah. is, is perfectly maintained. And Denzel yep. is just like, there's, a, there's something about this burned up body that I just can't put my finger on, but I feel a connection to her in some way. Yeah. Uh, did you notice in this scene, Denzel tastes her forehead? <laughs> he didn't he just, like, he's, like, <laughs> he's like, yep, that's definitely Diesel. That's definitely cum. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is the best looking corpse of all time, uh, Claire, played by uh, Paula Patton. He then goes to interview the, uh, the father of the, uh, the hot dead woman. He gets uh, uh, keys to her apartment. He learns that she was supposed to meet someone the night before. And as he's going out, he's like, uh, Agent Carlin, I want you to take these. And he's like, no, I have a picture of your dead daughter right here. We took it to the <laughs> morgue. And he's like, no, I need, I, need you, I need her to matter to you. And like, she looks even hotter in these photos. <laughs> well, no, yeah, he goes to her apartment. Her he, gets, apartment. he gets her keys from, like, uh, from her dad. And her apartment is in odd shape. There's like a bunch of bloody bandages in the trash. There's a glass of water on the mantle. There's... Um, 
magnets on the fridge that say you can save her, mm. which yeah, I'm curious. He basically checks her messages. She has a message from uh, her dad being like, hey, pick me up tomorrow. A message from her friend, which um, she's like, hey, worried about you. Can you call me back? And then she picks up the line and is like, is this a joke, Beth? And she's like, no, uh, no, this isn't. And then she's like, someone's here. I got to go. And then a Uh message from the ATF agent, Doug Carlin, Denzel Washington going, hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is uh, Denzel here. Just uh, calling to see how you're doing. And I was like, "What? Okay, like he." So he, she was the woman he calls earlier. Yes, like he, he, like the 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 woman who called him at the ATF left her number. He calls back. He hears his own voice on the answering machine. I, I think it'd be good if there was like, um, so like, yeah, the, he has you. There's you can save her spelled out in refrigerator magnets on her fridge. But I think it'd be cool if she had some like those like Cards Against Humanity refrigerator magnets. So it was like you can save her and like. The, the, and Frank's pussy is, <laughs> I don't know, he's a, I don't know, like, just like, uh, yeah, like, uh, what if, uh, fr- what if, what if you say freaking Hitler, too? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Denzel heads back to the FBI field headquarters in which, uh, Val and hipster scientist Adam Goldberg. My, my note here says <laughs> Adam Goldberg is looking sexual as hell. <laughs> <laughs> He's, yeah, he's a hipster scientist, and he tells them about Claire, like, and Bruce Greenwood, and he's like, look, the guy who blew up the ferry killed this woman, like, in a couple hours before, so if we solve her murder, like, we can solve this whole, the whole damn case. And, and then he goes, oh, like, uh, my, my partner, he's supposed to be on vacation, my ATF partner, uh, he's on vacation, so uh, why is his car parked here with all the other dead people's cars? And they're like... <laughs> Ooh, Ooh, yeah, about that. Uh, these are the cars from the ferry uh, parking lot. They're the, all the vehicles <laughs> of the victims. So he's just like, oh, shit, my partner. I guess, he's, I guess he's not on vacation. But the important thing is Val Kilmer and Bruce Greenwood, they're like, I like this guy. Let's bring him on the team. Yeah, Val goes up to Denzel and he's like, I'm putting together a team. We, want, uh, we need to know what to look at, where to look, and most importantly, what trails to follow. And also he says, quote, we've got some unique time constraints. I need someone who can take one look at a crime scene and tell us everything we need to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, whatever. (laughs) So they drive Denzel to what I'm calling the medium-sized Hadron Collider facility. (laughs) This set is so sick. It's like a bunch of screens, wires exposed everywhere. He's in the nerd hive. Mm -hmm. Now, this is like, this is another Tony Scott touch that's in a lot of his movies. Like, for instance, in Enemy of the State, they're always like in, in these kind of like uh, techno dystopian views of like surveillance and like law enforcement. There's always like the nerve center of like the tech guys who are yeah. like, have headsets and they're clacking away on on, tight, on keyboards. Looking for Jason Bourne. Yeah, kind yeah, of, yeah. Oh my God, that's Doug Carlin. <laughs> that's ATF agent Doug Carlin. <laughs> so like, yeah, like uh, Tony, he always says to show, the, show you the tech. So they, they, they sit him down in this room and... They're interested, like they're they're watching on like multiple different monitors. Um, what appears to be um, the the ferry dock um, before it exploded, but it's something something interesting about um, this surveillance footage, of which they're calling Project Snow White. Uh, they seem to have like God's eye view of the past, of like anything that happened uh, before this bombing took place. But what I love about the Project Snow White. Is that Project Snow White, like uh, through means that will be revealed uh, later in the plot, basically allows the federal government to create Tony Scott movies yeah. to spy on people. Literally, literally. Because, <laughs> like, it has the same 360 panorama helicopter yeah. shot. Zoom in, slow down, double expose that frame. They B- play the Nine Inch Nails music. <laughs> there's, like, literally one part where they, where Denzel is like, if it's just playing at one speed, why does it move really fast sometimes and really slow other times? <laughs> yes. And they're like, that's just us messing with the camera. <laughs> and he's like, okay, okay. <laughs> These are just our sort of flashy uh, editing tricks that we use to sort of enhance the personal style of Project Snow White. Wait, wait, wait. If, if we're looking at what happened in the past, why are the colors strobing and why is the, <laughs> why is the saturation really crazy and the contrast really high? <laughs> so uh, Denzel, you know, Agent Doug Carlin... He wasn't born yesterday. Mm-hmm. He knows that there's something, some, there, there's some, something going on here with this Project Snow White. Because they, the way they, the way they it explain to him, it to him, yeah, yeah, is they say that like, oh, through like you know a network of satellites, we can like 
sort of like create a digital simulation, like like a, a combination of like satellite uh, surveillance and then like closed circuit TV. We can like in real time edit together this kind of like digital approximation of what of four and a half days ago. But we can only go back like four and a half days, so we're always on that that timeline. You can't mm-hmm. look, you can't look ten minutes ago, and you can't look like five weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You only have this like four and a half hour t- uh, time frame to to do Project Snow White. And once, um, and it's going like in real time. Four and a half days ago, it's moving. So if yeah. you're looking at one thing, and you were like, "Oh shit, we were looking at the wrong thing. Let's go back and look at the other thing." You can't. You've already locked it in. That's the only thing you can see from that like place and like the problem that the reason they bring in uh denzel washington is because like enough time has transpired now that like by the time they bring him into project snow white they have about of what they're watching they have slightly less than or slightly more than three days before what they're watching will reach the point when the bombing happens Mm -hmm. so you know they don't know who they're looking for what do you do they need an expert director Exactly. To know where they, the action they, yes, is. They, yes. <laughs> they need someone to go Tony Vision. Yeah, and literally. That, and that's what Doug Carlin is there for. So they don't know who did this bombing. They don't know what to look for. So, so where do you look? And Denzel's like, I just met the body of this really hot woman. I would <laughs> yeah. love to see. I want to see her take a shower. <laughs> yeah, I want to see her take a shower. <laughs> she looked real clean, so, so I know she took one in the past <laughs> yeah. few days. So to solve the case, they have to spy on a dead woman. So what I love about this is, yeah, like they, they solve the case not just by watching movies, but by making them. As you were saying, it's all a question of like where to edit, what to focus on, mm-hmm. what performance do you um, highlight, what, or what gets left on the cutting room floor. And he's like, this stuff with the fairy, like none of these sailors are really characters to me. I think we're going to need to make yeah. an executive decision to focus on our love interest here in this murder investigation. Yeah, we need a woman in this movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we need Paula Patton. So yeah, like uh, they can, they, and like they can record what they're looking at, but they can't like rewind it, you know. And, uh, and another sort of tell, that, like maybe perhaps this is not just uh, CGI yeah. trickery. And that one of my with. one of my favorite lines um, in this part is he's like, "Okay, if it's uh, can someone can one of the seven dwarves tell me why how there's sound for this?" <laughs> and they all just like kind of look at him. They're like, "Oh, you know." Uh, like, anyway, uh, cell phones record <laughs> yeah. everything these days. We got their sound everywhere. We just edit it all together, you know. Um, so yeah, and then of course they do spy on her getting in the shower. Yeah, and like you know, like the the nerd hive is a buzz with them. Mm-hmm. The one nerd is like <laughs> hubba hubba, <laughs> a wooga. and they're like, "Can you d- move the camera away?" And the one nerd is like, "Hang on." Give the me the a minute. one woman in the office is like, "Is there any forensic importance to us uh, watching this woman take a shower?" And then he's like, "All right, all right." No, all right, one of them, <laughs> one of them actually says, "We got to make sure she gets clean." <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, like they, they're, they're, so they're they're watching this dead woman in her apartment, and they notice that she writes in her diary that she goes, "I get that feeling that I'm being watched," mm-hmm. and she sleeps with a gun under her pillow. So she's like, "There's something going on here." She's a little bit paranoid mm-hmm. about, like, uh, yeah, like I always feel like someone's watching me. And then she gets out of the shower when they're like looking around her apartment, and she starts being like, "Hello, is someone there?" And they're like, "Huh? Oh my gosh, maybe she." Denzel's like, can she? Does she know that we're there with this like camera shit? And they're like, no, that's a, that's ridiculous. Listen to what you sound like right now, man. <laughs> uh, the one, one more detail, like they 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 keep watching her, and she goes to bed, and she gets up in the morning, and I like the uh, her character Claire uh, prays before eating breakfast. You know, mm-hmm. she's a good girl. That's why that's oh, why yeah, that's yeah. why Doug Carlin likes her so much. She's a good girl. She prays before eating breakfast. Uh, Lord, thank you for making these Cheerios, honey nut. Amen. <laughs> And then, uh, so like, you know, uh, so after spying on this dead woman, uh, Agent Doug Carlin Denzel goes to uh, Paula Patton Claire's funeral. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's a New Orleans funeral. And her dad is just like, you know, she used to ask me, like, how come they only play the good music when people die? Well, Claire, honey, they're playing for you now. And Denzel's just like, God, if only there was a way I could stop this woman from being killed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so he goes to her funeral and then we're... Uh, Back to uh, Project Snow White. And he's like, continues to spy on her life. Like, you know, then now like two and a half days ago, like two nights ago, she goes out uh, with her friends to like a bar. She's out socializing, having a good time. And then she gets a call. Uh, earlier in the earlier when they were spying in her apartment, there was a circled classified ad for like her red Ford Bronco that she was selling in the classifieds. And uh, she, she picks up the phone. And who is calling her but the bomber to buy her Ford Bronco? Mm-hmm. 
And then they do some good old fashioned police work in combination with this because they figure out where that call is coming from. They find out that it was coming from a payphone that is right across from an ATM. And then they like grab the footage from that ATM, zoom in on it. And then this part was very funny. They use facial recognition software on a bag that the guy <laughs> yeah. is carrying. Yeah. And they're like, run it to see if that bag is that every bag <laughs> yeah. in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. And they find it in 10 seconds. <laughs> So yeah, like uh, now now they're on to, now they're on to the bomber. Denzel's instincts to um, spy on this hot lady get naked, pay off. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bomber, of course, is played by Jim Caviezel, mm-hmm. coming off the Passion of the Christ. And I was just reading a little bit in the, you know, I like to tap over to the uh, trivia section of IMDb on a movie that I'm going to talk about. Oh yeah, this on this was... movie, apparently, <laughs> uh, Val Kilmer created T-shirts for the entire cast and crew that said. We've got Malcolm X, Jesus Christ, and Jim Morrison. We can't lose. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was, there was another moment about um, uh, yeah. Denzel saying Jesus. Uh, they apparently in the first screening of the movie, they um, the first time Denzel sees Jim Caviezel's face, he says, Jesus. And the entire audience bursts into laughter because, of course, he plays Jesus in The Last Temptation of Christ. Or not oh, no, The Last Passion of the Passion of the Christ. Of the, Christ yeah. the, <laughs> the crazy one. <laughs> and... Um, the one that doesn't bless him, our Lord. And yeah, Savior. yeah. And see, because it's like Denzel's realizing that it's actually Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who did this bombing. <laughs> <laughs> and they, so they took that line out of the movie, but I really wish they kept it in. So uh, even, even though they're on to the, uh, the bomber, um, Denzel is um, still feeling a little depressed because he's like, you know, I'm watching a dead woman here. I feel like I'm getting more involved in her life. But like we can use this technology to help capture the man who killed her. But at the end of the day, no matter what, we still lose her. So so like he's he, they're snow waiting again and they're, they're, they're creeping on Claire back in her apartment. And here, Agent Denzel, aha, he gets an idea. So while the while the nerd hive is like, you know, zooming in and scrolling around and mm-hmm, uh, spying typing. on her. He gets an idea. He takes a laser pointer at it, and he points the laser at the screen they're watching. And then immediately, Snow White collapses and the entire city of New Orleans blacks out. But right before the monitors go down, the laser pointer that he points through the screen shows up on the wall of Claire's apartment two nights ago and mm-hmm. she notices it. And she sees she it. She sees it. And then here, we, okay, it's not surveillance, folks. It's time travel. Mm-hmm. Project Snow White, uh, they can fold space back onto itself. And here we get, we're treated to a great, uh, a, a, a great scene of Denzel, Denzel doing his normal guy routine when he's being, have to be told about science, like the Einstein yeah. Rosenbridge wormhole. And he's just like, what does that mean? <laughs> just because someone speak English to me, please. <laughs> and he's like, is she dead? Is she alive? Yeah, and he goes, he goes is she dead or is she alive? We're, like, we're watching a woman who's alive. But so is she alive or is she dead? And he goes, come on, people. Am I asking a hard question? And it's like, yes, you are. Yes. You're asking probably the hardest question <laughs> that anyone ever has. And then I, I like to see uh, Adam Goldberg, the hipster scientist character, uh, says in these very heady conversations, he says, I picked the wrong week to stop snorting hash. Yeah. So, Which is a very 2007 <laughs> like, like The time movie. travel nerds who wrote this movie, like, did they just not understand how drug, drugs work? I, I don't think so. I, I think th- this is like one of those things like um, in Touch of Evil when they're like all the weed fiends show up and they're like wearing leather jackets. <laughs> and like, <laughs> Swiss blades. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're leering to do, uh, do rapes and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so... That, that, you know, then he starts to wonder about the implications of this. Uh, the obvious one being, um, why can't we just go back in time? Yeah, and can we send someone killed? back? And in this movie, uh, they, they sort of set it up like it's the opposite of Terminator. Like you can't send any living thing back into the past. Mm-hmm. So Because it, it dies immediately. It hits the Weinberg... Uh, Rosenbridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it hits the firm of Einstein, Weintraub, and Rosenbridge. <laughs> It hits that, and then the heart stops. It's uh, no electrical signals can get through. And you know, like, and and Denzel, as normal guy, is talking to these scientists, and he goes, "What if that? What if there's something more than physics involved in all this? What if there's something spiritual?" And Adam Goldberg says, "It doesn't matter because what you're talking about now, God has already made up his mind." 
which I thought was a very good line. Like whatever mm-hmm. happened in the past, like like whether you can change it or not is irrelevant. Like these these things are settled. God has already decided on them. Mm-hmm. So like anything past that is just like is just speculation. And he says, my whole career I've been catching people after they do something horrible. And then like one of the other uh, the one of the other people in Project Snow White introduces the branch universe theory. The idea that if you could like mm-hmm. th- like the time as like a, a river, and if you throw a, a stone into thing, a big yeah. enough stone into it, it'll redirect the path of that river and then negate the, the, the other flow of it. And Adam Goldberg is like, thinks this is, he rolls his eyes. He's, He's like, like, this is science fiction. This is like throwing a pebble into the Mississippi. <laughs> and I also like that he's just like, this is crazy science fiction talk. It's just like, <laughs> let's go back to, g- you just signed a laser <laughs> into a woman's apartment who has been dead for two days and she saw it. So you can't send anything alive back into the past. Here we get into movie mindset. Denzel gets the idea what if we send a note back into the past? Mm-hmm. What if we send a handwritten note in the, the Snow White time cube core? And it literally is a time cube when they open up this large Hadron Collider. Mm-hmm. And uh, Denzel writes a note to himself. And like they, they put it in the time cube. Like terrorists surveilling docks at this time. Um, he yeah, he t- gives himself a note about where the, uh, where the bomber, like the time and place that he's going to be. Um, so they use they use Snow White to like scan this note and literally like move it back in time to a specific uh, time and place, Denzel's desk. So they do that like an, and then they're watching Denzel and his partner have an argument where he's like, you know, he's like, if I bust someone on a hunch, that's good police work. And then he's just like, you're playing too fast and loose, Agent mm-hmm. Carlin. Turn in your badge and your gun. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, so like, like uh, they're they're having a fight. Uh, Denzel had alluded to this, like about having some trouble with my partner, and like Denzel is just like, enjoy your vacation, and stalks out of the office. What happens? The note materializes on his desk, but his partner is the one to get the note about this uh, the terrorism suspect. Mm-hmm. He heads out to catch the suspect and is murdered. He by gets him. murked. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like they created like this begins to get into like the the, the time travel logic of this. God's is, already made up his mind. God has already made up his mind. Like in, in seeking to alter the past, they have created the conditions for what has already occurred, i.e., the murder of his partner. Mm-hmm. So they they watch uh, Jim Caviezel uh, kill his partner, and then like Project Snow White only has a certain radius of like uh, uh of like the, an area of space in which they can like do Tony Vision in. And Caviezel, the terrorist, gets into his car and starts driving away. And they're like, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna lose the feed. We're gonna lose the feed. We can't lose him. We need to know where we need to know where he is." And so then, like, well, then they go into like, "Can we like can, can we still can we use the rig?" And Denzel's <laughs> like, "Yeah, give me that rig." And they put they put the 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 VR goggle headset like in a car. Yeah, the rig is a big Hummer, ass, big ass Humvee, a Hummer H1 with um a VR headset inside. <laughs> and Denzel's like, "Give me that. I gotta go right now." So. Uh, yeah, Denzel peels out in a Humvee, and he's tra- like he's tailing a car from two nights ago on the, the New Orleans streets of the present moment. Yeah, and there is some great practical like Tony car accident shit. Oh yeah, of just cars getting like because just tossed around. Denzel is gunning it down the highway, wearing a VR headset. <laughs> 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 like, like, like the, yeah, exactly. Like the traffic that he's looking at is the traffic of two days ago. <laughs> yeah, and I really love. Um, just like the, the convention of like a, a time travel car chase. Oh, yeah. Was, is just very creative, very cool. So sick. And they do this picture in picture thing where you can see like, because Denzel has like one lens from the VR and one looking at the road. I have a headache just thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> truly. I'm having a panic attack thinking about <laughs> driving a car like that. <laughs> And it's it's like really fantastic because it really looks like it's going to be a near miss with every single car he passes. And he does hit like... Oh, he hits several, many yeah, cars. Yeah, he, he hurts a lot of people <laughs> in this car chase. <laughs> uh, so like, but but uh, the, the Humvee and the power pack works and he trails the sort of time ghost of Jim Caviezel and his car back to his sort of like bayou hideout you know mm-hmm. it's like it's like he's going to the bayou <laughs> yeah. he's going to the bayou <laughs> uh and then like okay like he, and he's got he's got the power rig he's got the power pack on he's got his eyesight and he's looking around and then like oh two days ago uh his partner was still alive in the back of this guy's the back of this back of jim caviezel's car and he sees him pull his body out of the car douse it with gasoline and then shoot him in the head yeah and the nerd there he's like 
the nerds back home watching with Project Snow White. They start like, crying. Brace yourself. Yeah. You're about to witness a murder. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to see his partner just get like executed in cold blood right mm-hmm. in front of him. And But before that even, when Denzel shows up, he's in the future. They're watching it in the past. They can't see what he sees. And he's like, it looks like there was a huge explosion on this like yeah. compound. And there's a an ambulance kind of driven through this one building. Yeah. So like like, so like he's he's interacting with the wreckage of something that happened at the terrorist hideout. Like as he's looking at the uh, as he's looking pensively at the charcoal stain on the pavement of what used to be his partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rest of his body is with the gators. Because look, you can't have a terrorist bayou hideout and not have like a body alligator body disposal system. Yeah, oh, and also in doing this. They created the scenario where the bomber needed Claire's truck. So not only has he doomed his partner to be murdered, he's doomed he is, Claire. He's he also well. doomed Claire to be murdered because his car is now covered in bullet holes and blood, mm-hmm. and he needs something. He needs a, a similar make, i.e., a Ford Bronco, to get that bomb on the ferry. So then yeah. he calls Claire to ask for to buy her car, setting up her murder. So in the present, we get we get a great scene of Jim Caviezel being arrested on a fan boat, and you know. Tony loves his vehicles, and anytime you can have fan boats included in the movie, you know, oh, yeah. you know it's gonna be good shit. So oh like, yeah, and he, as he's getting arrested, he does a Nazi salute, which I thought was re- very interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, here's an interesting part of this movie. Like I said, like th- this is 2007. It's very much a movie about the war on terrorism. But I remember some people chirping about it when it came out because they were like, "How come it's not an Arab terrorist?" <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And like he, like you know, Jim Caviezel is very much playing like a the Oklahoma City bombing uh, is referenced in this, and he's very much playing like a, a white nationalist, sort of like an anti-government, kind of. like a Christian white nationalist terrorist. Mm-hmm. And I gotta say, uh, Caviezel is very good in this. He's very frightening. He's awesome. It? Yeah, yeah. So they arrest Caviezel, and um, Denzel interrogates him, and he does the classic uh, interrogation technique of going, you know, I'm with the ATF, and I just gotta say, uh, your your precision, your bomb making. It's incredible. Uh, the whole thing about your plan, uh, just top notch work. And if you, if you, and you're really you handsome too. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't mind, I'd like to use this recorded interrogation as sort of like a textbook for like how to how to train our ITF agents to be better mm-hmm. at catching genius criminals like you, who like obviously have a good reason for doing what they're doing. And he's like, yeah, yeah. The the tree of liberty needs to be watered with the blood of uh, horny sailors of tyrants, from time to time yeah. <laughs> and their children. Yeah. <laughs> So like you know he 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 tells her he tell he tells Denzel about murdering Claire, and um you know and then like he gets into this whole thing about like you know like you don't understand like there's not going to be a trial like I have a fate like I have a, I have a fate and you know like you need divine intervention to yeah. stop me the way that um he's talking it's almost like and it does kind of imply this throughout the movie it's kind of implied that like Jim Caviezel is so insane that he understands that time travel not only is real but that. <laughs> Denzel Washington's going to try to use it to stop him, (laughs) which I thought was really cool. And then he says a line to him, something like, "Um, Satan reasons like a man, but God thinks of eternity. And like, you need divine intervention to stop me. And then we get a classic cop moment where he goes, you're going to, yeah. He's like, I need divine intervention. Well, you're going to need some KY jelly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And you're being raped in prison. (laughs) So uh, then they shut down the investigation. It's over. The guy confessed to the bombing. He confessed. But uh, however, they can't charge him with Claire's murder because then they would have to say in court how they obtained the evidence. Yeah. But like, I don't understand. Like, uh, wouldn't that also apply to his confession of the terrorist bombing? Like, like how he was arrested in the first place? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. Okay, whatever, whatever. <laughs> well, they'll, they'll use Project Snow White. To yeah, 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 They'll, they'll, they'll yeah. change that. Well, no, because they say we can't use Project Snow White anymore. They're like, no, 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 we have to. You don't get it because like we need more evidence. And he's the guy is like, you turn in your badge and you're good. <laughs> you turn in your time travel helmet. Yeah. You turn in your you turn in your your rig. Your power Oculus pack. Rift. Yeah. <laughs> you turn in your <laughs> Oculus. Yeah. <laughs> but then you know, like he's haunted by this idea of the, Claire's still dead. All those people on the ferry still dead. You know, I mean, like mm-hmm. uh, this is the classic thing. Like, you know, what if you were on that plane when nine eleven happened? Yeah. You know? What if you were Mark Wahlberg, but knew due to projects in a way what was going to happen? Oh, they should remake this with Mark Wahlberg in nine eleven. Now, this whole movie is, like I said, like like uh, in two thousand seven, the kind of like tail end of the Bush years and America's like obsession and fear over terrorism. Like this is this is very much a movie version of like what if you could stop nine eleven? Oh, like, absolutely. If you could go back in time and stop nine eleven. Mm-hmm. So think back, he goes back to her apartment one more time. You can save her. What that obviously implies is, look, if I'm, I'm going to take my shot to save Claire and these people, I'm, if I have a chance to stop 9-11 from happening, just prosecuting or killing Osama bin Laden, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. And 
Adam Goldberg, the hipster scientist, is very easily just. Yeah, he calls a sense to just like allowing him to do this. Yeah, he calls Adam Goldberg. He's like, "Why don't you warm that thing up for me?" And Adam <laughs> Goldberg's like, "You got it, boss." <laughs> and then Adam Goldberg, it cuts to Adam Goldberg hanging up the phone. And Val Kilmer's there, and he's like, "Just turn off the lights on your way out." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is funny because they've already caused like a nationwide blackout twice yeah, using this and technology, and they're going to do it a third time <laughs> yeah, before yeah, the movie yeah. is over. <laughs> So I originally said that like uh, this movie was anti-Terminator rules because nothing alive can go back. But then when they send Denzel back, it goes back to Terminator rules because he says you've got to get naked to keep the mass low. And they're like, eh, you, can keep, you can keep your underwear on. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can keep your underwear on. You can still preserve some dignity as you crawl in the time cube. So like this is a really funny part of this movie. Like to send Denzel back in time, he literally just gets in a box. Yeah. Like, he crawls in a box in his underwear. <laughs> it's like primer. Yeah. Yeah. And how does he solve the problem about um, being dead upon arrival? Oh, he writes revive yes, me on his yeah. chest. <laughs> they, they send him back in time to a hospital and then like a blackout happens in the past because he gets sent there and the lights flicker on the hospital and there's just like another body seizing on a gurney yeah. right next to this guy having like open heart surgery. Which I thought it was so funny. If, they're, if you're sending him to a hospital, it's so funny to write revive me on his chest. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're going to see him and be like, well, nothing we can do now. <laughs> Um, so like yeah, he 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 wakes up in the hospital. He's seeing news coverage. They're like, as Fat Tuesday celebrations begin, the entire city of New Orleans is filled with fun and sailors. The one thing that we know won't happen today is a horrible bombing, killing <laughs> <Yep>. hundreds. <laughs> um, so like yeah, then he uh, he like basically uh, he he robs some guys like a like a oh. What an ambulance? Mm -hmm. he, he steals an ambulance for mm -hmm. some EMS workers. Takes some security guard's gun. I don't know if you noticed this, but one of the EMS guys he robs is I don't know the name of this actor, but he's the pickup truck guy in Unstoppable. He's the welder guy. Oh shit! Who, I love like, that who, like, guy. Who, like trails the the train on his like yeah, yeah, huge yeah. F one fifty welding pickup truck. Yeah, who's so like some, you guys Tony regulars? Up again. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, so he steals the ambulance and then he just drives straight to the bayou. Mm -hmm. the Bayou hideout and it's cutting between Jim Caviezel is about to kill Paul yeah, Patton like he's, he's like, like he's dousing her in gas mm -hmm. uh, she still looks great though she no yeah so she's good. still she's <laughs> even with a bag and duct tape <laughs> yep. on her head uh, uh -huh. she's great so like Denzel he drives the ambo in like just in time right as if he's about to cut off her fingers with like uh, you know some garden shears or something and then we see the whole place blows up this is how his hideout got torched mm -hmm. this is how the ambulance is there so he manages to save Paula Patton um, from Jim Caviezel, but Caviezel gets away. And from there, uh, like he's shot in the process. Where do they go? To Paula Patton's apartment, which is you know on the way to the ferry. Mm -hmm. And then we get to see uh, how he touched everything and covered it in blood yeah. uh, from when he originally goes to her apartment. The gauze covered bandages, or the blood covered like gauze. And, the and trash. also like earlier, the, like, the CSI guys would be like, is this the first time you've investigated a murder? Because your fingerprints are all over this lady's house. And, and we saw like, when huh? he first go in there, he had the, he had the latex gloves yeah. on. And he's like, ah, who cares? I'm not thinking about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to think too hard about that. <laughs> um, so then like, yeah, like uh, we, we see like all of the uh, the circumstances that led to like uh, him finding like those bloody bandages. And then he does the fridge magnets you yeah, can save her you can he sends her. himself a message in the future but here's the thing as this is going on he seems to like he keeps betraying that he knows a great deal about this woman and her yeah. life and He's her like, life give me some of your um your house is on the way let's stop there you can give me some of your ex-boyfriend's clothes in the in the <laughs> thing and change your dress because that dress that's that dress is bad news <laughs> yeah and she's and, like okay and uh <laughs> but it's like he, he, she clearly gets the impression that this guy's been stalking her yeah so she pulls a gun on him and uh, and like in doing so, he says like you know call the ATF like I'm an ATF agent, like call the call the ATF office. She calls the ATF office. That's the call that he gets mm -hmm. that he missed in the beginning of the that movie. He calls her back and he calls her back. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then he now in front of her with the gun, he, he hears uh, her friend Beth call and her pick up and go Beth, is this a joke? And yeah, because he, he says your friend Beth is about to call. Yeah. She's worried about you. She's going to say that she's worried that you didn't call her last night. You're going to pick it up halfway through the message. And then it happens, obviously. And then she's like, OK, maybe this guy is for real. Um, and then also and she also sa he also says um, an important line for a callback later. He's like, what if you had to tell someone the most important thing in the world and you knew they wouldn't believe you? And she says, I would try. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, difficult oh? to explain time travel. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, my yeah, head yeah. is hurting just talking about it. <laughs> so uh, she calls the ATF agent and asks him to describe uh, Denzel Washington. And he's like, I'm really like uh, about six foot three, uh, pretty handsome black guy. And then I'm just like, yeah, that's Denzel. Okay. Yeah. All right. This checks out. 
So he's like, yeah, like like the, the guy who tried to kill you is going to blow up this ferry. So we need to go to the ferry. They they arrive. They need to go to the ferry dock, and she says, "What are you going to do?" And he says, "Defuse the bomb." Well, there is a there's a moment where he realizes because he like put his fingerprints all over everything. He's putting like the glass of water on the mantle, and he realizes suddenly, "Oh, I haven't changed anything. Everything's still the same. Yeah. So something must be wrong. There must be something still like that's going to go wrong." And so he tells Paula Patton, like he kind of panics and is like. Okay, you better come with me to the to the dock so that you you'll be safe with me. You know, it's just like you know, if those other five hundred people die, fine, but at least I will have saved one person. Mm -hmm. And they show up to the ferry dock as we see, like as the beginning of the movie starts, and we see all these like happy horny sailors, and they're like, "We're gonna get laid, all yeah. right? It's <laughs> Mardi Gras." And he tells her to like, "Okay, go to that, go to that cop." Once the ferry leaves and I'm on it and tell them that there's a bomb on it. Like, you'll be okay. Like, like don't worry about it. Um, and then, like, right when he leaves her, he gives her a kiss. So, time travel. Has God made up his mind? Can you change the past? I don't know. But he kisses her once, so it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. But Caviezel is also there at the ferry because he knows something's not right as well because an ambulance just plowed into his. Yeah. <laughs> like, just, no one had any idea who he was or what he was doing. And this guy just randomly shows up and starts driving an ambulance through his house and shooting at him. Mm -hmm. it's, so, and it, it kind of implies that he just gets like a feeling because he's there. He checks on the bomb, like walks away. And then Denzel gets on the ferry and then Paula Patton's watching. And then Paula Patton sees him like running up the thing to get on the ferry before it leaves. So it's like he just was like, nah, something's not right. And he like runs, gets on the ferry, and then Paula Patton is like, okay, I got to get on this ferry too. I got to do the one thing he told me not yeah, to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're down on like the, the lower level of the ferry where all the cars are. And, you know, uh, uh, Caviezel's there. And then like some security guards are like, oh, oh, sir, you can't be here right now. Like uh, he's already done this to Denzel. And he's sort of like walked up and taken like a more stealth approach to get back down to where the bomb is uh this, the second time <laughs> the security guard does the same thing to Caviezel uh he's not so lucky because he just blows him away immediately yeah. and then like you know like they, they, they know something's up they shots are fired all the security comes down and we get a great scene of Caviezel uh dual wielding mp5 yeah just, yeah yeah, like, yeah. Just, just, spraying, going to yeah town. just going to town going to town it's pretty awesome and then like uh like when Denzel faces off with Caviezel he spits all the stuff that Caviezel told him in the future mm -hmm. in the interrogation about man and God and, and fate, fate in the yeah. future. And then Caviezel's like, oh shit, this guy's spitting facts. Yeah, <laughs> this, guy's talking like, about, Yo. this guy's talking about God, reasons in eternity. That's, so that's what I've been thinking to myself as I built this bomb to kill yeah. all these people. This guy gets white nationalism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this guy really gets it. <laughs> um, so like, uh, you know, like there, there, there's a cool face off between them. Uh, Paula Patton, um, like she like floor, like she he, she's handcuffed inside the car. Caviezel got the drop on her. She's handcuffed in the car with the bomb, but uh, like she like Denzel, like he gets the keys and he starts the car and he's like floor it, and she just like slams into him. He like, like the fender of the car hits him square in the middle of the waist, mm -hmm. cr sm sandwiches him between another car, and is like the torso is like leaning over it, and he's like. Still trying still, to still shoot. trying to pull yeah, yeah, that yeah. MP5 trigger, but Denzel just domes him. Mm -hmm. Diesel done terrorist compromised to a permanent end. Mm -hmm. But however, there's not really enough time left to defuse the bomb, and all the security uh, on the the ferry thinks that they're the bombers, and they're yeah. like, "Get out of the car!" And he goes, "Only one thing to do: floor it again." They drive the car with the bomb in it off the ferry. And like as it sinks and like the ferry, it's a very cool like underwater scene of like there's the ferry like going such, over the car. Like, and there's such a cool shot of like when the car hits the water of like Denzel's face going like forward in the car, like they just hit something, but it hits a plane of water and like goes underwater. It's like really, I, yeah. It's like just I said, like, like like Tony, like Tony this, Vision. This is, this is like the Tony Vision thing, like in, in action or anything. Like, there's no angle into like any sort of like dynamic moment of action like there's no angle that he won't film from there's nothing that he won't show you like he is mm -hmm. trying to show you the most at all times yeah and like, like that is really the, like like the, the the key component of his like later style and like i said this kind of maximalist filmmaking that he really goes for and we see it in this great uh climax of the movie so uh Denzel is underwater. He manages to get the steering wheel off the column. I guess it's a Tesla or something, so he just pulls it off. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Easy. <laughs> um, 
So uh, he saves Claire. She goes out through the windshield. She like narrowly avoids the propellers of the ferry in another very like uh, <laughs> tense tension. moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, tense moment. So, uh, but Denzel is still in the car as it sinks to the bottom uh, of the river and then blows up. Mm-hmm. So he's in the car. Denzel Denzel is dead. But Paula Patton, he he does he does change at least one thing about the past. In addition to saving all the other people on the ferry, he saves the hottest woman in the state of Louisiana. Mm-hmm. And Paula Patton is mourning. All the people are rescued on the side. It's like all these people that we saw earlier who were like, where's my daughter? Where's my daughter? And then (laughs) it cuts to the daughter like showing up and being like, I'm okay. (laughs) And um, then... She still lost her stupid doll, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her doll. All the are like, fuck this. I'm going to the French Quarter. (laughs) Trying to get a hooker. Let's just have sex with each other. Let's go back to the hotel. (laughs) Fuck this. (laughs) Um, Uh... So like yeah, like she's sitting down, she's rattled, and then like you know, like a cop is like, oh, the the cop at the very end of the movie is another character actor. Fuck, I'm forgetting him at this point. He's been in a lot of movies, but he has one line in this movie, and he goes, oh ma'am, we're gonna need you to just uh, s- s- sit tight here for a second. Uh, someone's gonna come by and take your statement. Who comes by to take her statement? It's our old friend ATF agent Doug Carlin from four mm-hmm. days ago, from the past. From the it, it's. It's Denzel Mark II, who is still alive, has not. And the cool thing about this is the way that Denzel Prime dies ensures that there's like never a, like an autopsy where they're like, yeah. hey, uh, can you explain this? <laughs> yeah. Hey, why are you dead? <laughs> Did you have a twin that you never told us we about? We have a body for you to identify. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. Huh. That's me. That's interesting. <laughs> So it's probably like, yeah, like uh, destroyed beyond all recognition, you know, like they're not even going to bother to look at the teeth, you know, like this, yeah, is, the, yeah, yeah. this is the bottom of the Mississippi River after like an Oklahoma City style bomb just like it decimated every atom it, in his body. It looks like the like underwater nuke test when the bomb explodes, yeah. re- truly. So uh, and then, you know, we've met before, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like then they get in the car and Denzel has a moment as they drive away of, and I like this because they never say they it. They never say it. They never say it. But like he has this, like he's, he's, he's such a good actor. Patton. You can tell. Yeah, no, it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. This is what I mean about like giving these audience access to these uh, unspoken moments of uh, sort of privacy and mm-hmm. intimacy. And uh, yeah, Paul Patton goes like, what is it? And he sort of like The Beach Boy song is on the radio Be- again. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry, baby. Everything is going to turn out all right. He sort of pauses for a second and then goes, nah. And I just, I just love it. Like he's like, He's like, the feeling I'm experiencing right now is called deja vu. <laughs> yeah. A sense that you've been somewhere before or <laughs> experienced something already. And, you know, the Beach Boys plays, they drive off. And then the, 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 the ending, the, like the end title card says, this film is dedicated to the people of New Orleans. The brave and enduring spirit <laughs> of the people of New Orleans. Which will be a perfect segue into our next movie, Man on Fire, which also mm. ends with a oh tribute God. to the people of another city. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are back and now now we move on to 2004's Man on Fire. This was the uh first mo- this was the like the the first movie that Tony Scott did with Denzel since Crimson Tide in 1995. So it's like an almost a... And then he would go on after Man on Fire to work with Denzel in a rapid succession of like four mm-hmm. other movies. Um, apparently, uh, uh, him being cast in this movie came about because they were both at the same dentist office in LA and hadn't seen each other in 10 years. And he was like, oh, Denzel, I, I would love to work with you again. <laughs> yeah. have, you, have you heard of Dakota Fanning? <laughs> I think she's great. So this is 2004's Man on Fire. There were 24 kidnappings in Mexico City in the last six days. Have you protected a lot of children before, Mr. Creasy? I don't know. Bodyguards got to be close to people. You know, I'm no good at that. Good things happen too, Creasy. Yeah? Like what? Like meeting me. <laughs> Greasy, you're smiling. Vita! Vita! Run! Run! 
you know, we talked about in Deja Vu some examples of Tony Vision or going Scott mode. And Man on Fire is the one, is the movie in which he pushes all of these tendencies. And like I said, his hyperkinetic, like action auteurist, like idiosyncratic style. He, like, they let him just open the throttle in this movie. And like, he goes for broke on all of it. Like, a lot of these techniques that we're talking Too about. Too much sometimes. <laughs> He was very, he was like way more restrained in Deja Vu, both in the subject matter and, like I said, in going in going Tony Vision. But I'd like to, like to begin by talking about Man on Fire, as I would rate it as very much the best of the George W. Bush era of a specific kind of action movie that I guess well, I will simply call dad action movies mm -hmm. taken with Liam Neeson being another uh, prime example of this and like oh yeah they're very much a reflection of like war on terror America because they are all about how the world is a terrifying place and very specifically so unfair and evil to Americans in particular yeah and so like how do we respond to that we, we don't like we need people we need men who are past middle age we need past middle age men to go back to taking care of business the way they did, mm -hmm. you know, back in the back when America was strong, they need to take care of business. And how do you take care of business? What's the most important thing? Protecting our beautiful white daughters from mm -hmm. the, the Mexicans, immigrants, and, terrorists, immigrant, immigrant gangs, and you know what? Sex trafficking. Yeah, yeah, yeah woke mob. <laughs> These guys aren't angels, okay? <laughs> sure, they've killed hundreds, implied maybe even thousands of people in the past. <laughs> For God knows what reason. A reason that makes them try for to kill the themselves CIA. like for three the CIA. times. In the movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, you know what? When when the penny drops, they 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 answer the call. If your if your angelic daughter is kidnapped, mm -hmm. who do you want who do you want on the case? If the whitest Hispanic daughter <laughs> in the world is kidnapped. Do you do you want some some touchy feely uh, millennial uh, uh -huh. CIA assassin to kick her back? Do you want Adam Goldberg on this? <laughs> really? No. <laughs> so th this uh, Man on Fire was uh, written by Brian Hedgeland and another bit of uh, IMDb trivia from this movie apparently uh, he, he wanted to remake this movie or, or write a new version of it because uh, he was inspired by when he first saw the original Man on Fire this is a remake of a movie from the late 70s with uh, Scott Glenn in the lead role uh, he went into the video store that Quentin Tarantino worked at in mm -hmm. the 80s and asked, hey, what's a good movie to watch? And he recommended the original Man on Fire. I am I also looked at the trivia, and I really hope you missed this one piece of <laughs> trivia that I... I, I, think, I think I know the one you're talking yeah. about. But like, <laughs> when, when we introduce this character, we will discuss probably my favorite IMDb trivia for a movie. So uh, this movie begins... Um, is it another another uh, Scott mode technique he used in this movie is the use of like dynamic subtitles and title cards that like this. stay on screen for like a long time to like em emphasize the line. But this movie begins with a little a little factoid, and that fact is that in Latin America there's a kidnapping once every sixty minutes. Yeah, which so by the time you listen to this episode, two kidnappings will have happened <laughs> yes. in, in Mexico City alone, <laughs> and um. I, it really reminds me of the um, opening title card of Den of Thieves, where it's like yes. <laughs> every 45 seconds, there's a bank robbery in the United States of America. It's like, I don't know if that's... <laughs> I think that a, can't a, be hey, every 45 seconds, there's a freaking bank bailout in America. That's <laughs> yeah. the real robbery, folks. <laughs> so the opening credits of Man on Fire, if you want to give people, if you would like to show to someone or demonstrate to them, like the most distilled, the most uncut crack of like the Scott mode, Tony vision style of movie making. The first, op the opening credits of this movie are the most Tony Scott thing ever. Cause we get basically a very condensed storyline of a kidnapping taking place in Mexico city. We see like this nice young couple. The man is just like grabbed off the street, thrown in the car. His family gets the, the, the ransom call. They arrange the money drop they cut off his ear. Yeah. They it. cut off his ear. But like, this is all done in like this, like, totally saturated films like desaturated film stock it's shot just like, like strobing like lights and then like zooming in super zooming high out. contrast it's it, it's like if you've seen that meme where um it's squidward from spongebob and his face shrinks and it's like all the effects happen on it all at once <laughs> It's shot like that, but with a strobe effect also well, added. I mean, it's funny because like like Tony Scott's visual style, I think, can be compared at least just is like a still image to like really deep fried SpongeBob memes. Yeah, literally like memes that have been like copied and like copied and recopied like 
thousands of times over mm-hmm. so that the original image quality is like so degraded but then like you can still see like yeah you can still see Spongebob smoking a blunt or something yeah, like yeah, that yeah. Like, Spongebob dry shrunk up in Sandy's tree dome and it says <laughs> my face when <laughs> my face when my uh, my boyfriend gets kidnapped in Mexico City <laughs> uh, so like yeah, we get this um sort of like a mini movie that will give us like a sort of like a rehearsal for events to happen in mm-hmm. this movie and we're introduced to uh the the villain of the movie the the, the voice as he's called in the movie mm-hmm. is like sir let me ask you do you love your family do you love your family as everything what would you pay to get your son back so and then, and then in the in the credit sequence yeah they cut off this guy's ear they give instruction for the money drop but uh thankfully this is a happy ending because they leave this newly earless young man on the highway yes. to be collected by his uh, family and the opening credits also reveal that like something I had totally forgotten that like four of my favorite actors ever are all in this movie. And Let's it's run it down. Denzel, Christopher Walken, mm-hmm. Mickey Rourke, and Giancarlo Giannini. Giancarlo. <laughs> yeah, I was an, like, an Holy Italian shit. guy. <laughs> like he's, he's, he's eaten a lot in his career playing um, a Latin character. Oh he's yeah. Sort of like, uh, oh yeah. But as an, as like the, the coolest looking like older Italian mm-hmm. guy ever. Like, Lena Wertmuller's muse yeah. from the 70s, literally. <laughs> like if you want a guy to look cool smoking cigarettes in a movie, yeah. Giancarlo is your go-to. If you want a puppy dog eye guy yeah. who be- tr- becomes a socialist to get pussy in, the, <laughs> in like a movie in the 70s, <laughs> that's your guy. Uh, you might remember him from, uh, he was the uh, Italian cop that tries to uh, blackmail Hannibal Lecter to, uh, to a quite nasty end for himself and Ridley, Ridley Scott's Hannibal. Mm-hmm. One of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> but he was also um, uh, James Bond's contact in uh, Monaco and Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. Or Montenegro, rather, I should say. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're treated to this like, uh, like you know, mini movie in like the most Tony vision that you're ever going to see. And when this was like, th- this movie is like, it's almost kind of like uh, nausea inducing, but I say that in a good way. Like, it, like if if you if you suffer from epilepsy, like definitely do sit, not watch sit this, this movie, movie out yeah, because yeah, yeah. like it calms down a little bit. But especially in the opening credits, and then whenever whenever shit is about to get real, Tony Scott's camera is like never not moving. Yeah, like it is. It is just like it is constant movement, constant energy. Like a, like, and then like he 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 slows it down at times to like give the plot and characters some room to breathe but then like at a moment's notice he will just crank that dial back to 11 and put you in this like seizure inducing fugue state of action and uh sort of ominous portents it's like he did salvia once and it ruined <laughs> and it ruined his life truly and like and in this movie though like uh, it's crucial like it, it's crucial to tony vision is that he also pushes um, like music editing and like sound effects? Oh yeah, like like he like he not just double exposes like f- like a film uh, uh, d- does double exposure of film. He like lays two different songs over each other in this like wall of noise and yeah. like assault on your senses. There's a part where four different songs play within like a thirty second period, and it's really incredible. Uh, but yeah, I, I like I, I want to like. Uh, hopefully, we can edit back in the Nine Inch Nails music that they keep playing. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> and then, like when things get serious, they play like uh, the type of music that usually uh, always plays in Hollywood whenever you're in a foreign country and something profound is happening because it's always like yeah, oh my god. Yeah, and your and your core type thing. Um. So uh, after the opening credits, enter a very unshaven Denzel crossing the border at El Paso, heading to visit his friend, played by Christopher Walken in Juarez. Everyone looks like a crumpled paper bag in this movie. (laughs) (laughs) It's really crazy. So like, yeah, Denzel's like, uh, you know, he seems like a a broken guy. He's a drunk. And now like, here's what I'm going to do. It's like, I, I think I think Man on Fire is probably to, like it's up there like this or last boy scout for me would be like tony scott's two best movies mm-hmm. and it's it's hard it's difficult in, in assessing tony scott's like uh canon of films as a director i like i regard this as like maybe his most personal film it seems that way to me mm-hmm. and like it's hard to say because like i don't he definitely has interests in his movies but his interests are like uh technical and like in service of like action and story i don't like i don't know how much of like himself he puts into these movies but like 
maybe this is a little too easy given what we know about the end of Tony Scott's life, but Denzel's character in this movie has a real melancholy to him. And as, like, you know, as we'll see later on in the movie, like is suicidal as well. Tony Scott did famously kill himself mm -hmm. in 2012 by jumping off a bridge in San Pedro. I, I can't help but read into like the, the very... The, the broken and melancholic uh, portrayal of the character that Denzel Washington plays in this movie, like perhaps something about like communicating kind of like an, an inner pain in Tony Scott's own life or something. I mean, mm -hmm. like, like I said, maybe that's a little too cheesy and on the nose, but like this is a, this is a performance by Denzel in a movie for Tony Scott that really is infused with like a, a lot of, a lot of pain and like, like uh, emotional agony. Yeah. And I think it's like interesting because he's pretty much done this movie before almost more or less with the movie revenge have you ever seen revenge it's, it's probably my least favorite that's Tony that's Scott his worst movie, movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah his worst movie uh, okay uh for those who don't know revenge is the movie he made right after top gun and it stars uh, kevin costner madeline stowe and, and ricardo Mont. no no aiden aiden quinn oh, okay aiden quinn and kevin costner is like a hotshot fighter pilot who retires and goes to hang out with his friend who's like this rich land baron in mexico and then immediately falls in love with his wife and has an affair with her that's buddy. That's the one thing you don't do to a rich Mexican mm -hmm. guy. And basically, it's just about how Aiden Quinn like uh, cuts his wife's face up and then pours her out, and then like nearly. It's about Kevin Costner having to save Madeline Stowe from a Mexican whorehouse, basically. Yeah, it's a kind of a nasty movie, but uh, you know, and like, it's kind of boring for the yeah. first like hour. It's very very slow. I, Costner has no juice. I'm yeah, you know. <laughs> It, you know, I mean, compare Costner to like Tom Cruise or Denzel Washington in yeah. Tony Scott mode. It's crazy. Like, yeah, it's nuts. So we see like we see Denzel, we see Denzel who's p paying a visit to his old pal uh, played Rayburn. By Rayburn, played by Christopher Walken, who's an expat living in Mexico. He's got a Mexican wife. He runs a security business where he like ferries Japanese businessmen from like the Japanese car industry, like to and forth from El Paso. And he's, and like, he's loaded. He has a Jeff Koons statue <laughs> in his pool, <laughs> like, literally. <laughs> yes, he's living like a king uh, down in Mexico now. Uh, Another bit of uh, another another interesting factoid from the IMDb trivia section. Apparently, uh, almost every scene with Denzel and Christopher Walken in this movie they improvised. That's so cool. And it's just like two cool guys having yeah. a good time together. Like <laughs> these are too... these are two old pros mm -hmm. who are like they're just they're just mixing it up together. They're just like they can just hey, all you need to know like this, your old friends with a haunted past. Yeah. Have at it, and then they're just <laughs> yeah. like perfect, nailed it first time. <laughs> so yeah, Denzel. He likes a drink every now and again. He's been moving around, probably like doing wet work for Christ knows what else. And, you know, he says to Christopher Walken, you know, do you think God will forgive us for what we've done? And it's just like, I don't know, but maybe, maybe there's a chance you can forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. So then, basically, uh, Walken's like, look, you can get work as a bodyguard, basically. And then, mm -hmm. we, then we cut to the introduction of... My favorite actor, Mickey Rourke. Mm -hmm. Mickey Rourke and Mark Anthony, the uh, the singer Mark Anthony, who's yeah. also a very good actor too. He was very good in Bringing Out the Dead, the Martin Scorsese, Paul Schrader movie. Mm -hmm. Mickey Rourke is uh, the lawyer to like a very prominent Mexican family. Um, they own they own a like an auto plant in in Juarez, and they're trying to they're trying to get, like make some deal with the American uh, car companies and uh, get out of the Japanese. So like Mickey Rourke is lighting up a cigar. And he's telling him about the kidnapping we just saw in the opening credits of the movie. And he's saying, look, like for insurance purposes, uh, you have to hire a bodyguard. OK. Apparently, Tony Scott had been like looking for a project to do with Mickey Rourke for a long time. It's, it seems crazy that this is, I think, their first movie together. Right after this, he would do Domino starring Mickey Rourke and mm -hmm. uh, Kira Knightley. But would you like to share? Is this the IMDb trivia that uh, that I, I no, caught? actually. Oh, my okay. God. Thank God. This is, this is the best. This is the best IMDb trivia for a movie I've ever seen. All it said is Denzel Washington did not get along with Mickey Rourke while filming this movie, which is really funny because they have no scenes together and Mickey Rourke is in the movie for like five minutes. Yeah. So like, I just like the one day he was on set, he maybe was like such an asshole. He said like, something racist said, like yeah, under yeah, his yeah, breath yeah. and Denzel heard it like literally. But look, Mickey Rourke, I think Mickey Rourke will be the subject of our next movie mindset episode. You're treated to just enough Rourke in this, but I really, yeah. wish, I really wish there was more Rourke in this movie. Apparently, there's a deleted scene where Mark Anthony cuts off his head with a sword. Yeah. And they, I was really upset that that got. How did that end up <laughs> on the cutting room floor? I think it's because Mark Anthony's not. I mean, he's great in Bringing Out the Dead, but in this, I didn't. You know, I mean, like <laughs> he's he, doing his best. He's, I mean, like, I mean, like he worked as like a very pathetic, awful man. Yeah, awful yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 
So basically, like, they're like, oh, he's like, look, you don't have to hire a good bodyguard. Just hire a cheap one, and then, like, your insurance policy will re-up, and then you can just fire him. Mm -hmm. So, hey, cheap bodyguard? Denzel, that's a, this is easy work for you. So, like, uh, the next scene, he's clean-shaven, and he's, like, he's taking the job. Wait, before that, there's a part where you see very briefly inside Denzel's file, and Mark Anthony's, like, very impressive. And this is the piece of trivia that oh, okay. I... Inside the file... And we know that um, Denzel's birthday, his character's birthday in this. Is oh, yes. I have it at the end here. It is January 4th, 1956. Mm -hmm. And it says in his file that he worked in Marine Force Recon or Army right. Recon at Camp Lejeune. <laughs> so he's eligible for significant financial <laughs> compensation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only, if only he had gotten that uh, Selena yeah, and Barnes style settlement for whatever yes. toxic shit he was exposed to there, <laughs> he wouldn't have had to take in this job. But then, yeah. well, then that would have been very bad for a sweet little Dakota Fanning. Yes, but, yes. So he's looking. Yeah, he's looking at his resume, and they're like, um, you know, assassinated Patrice Lumumba. <laughs> like I don't know. Like he's yeah. too, 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 too old. <laughs> not, not old enough for that. But yeah, like he's he's been doing he's been doing wet work for the CIA for like a long time. And mm -hmm. Mark Anthony's like. Well, you have an impressive resume, but like, you know, why are you so cheap? Like, what's the catch? And he's like, Yeah, I'm a drunk. Like, I, I yeah. drink. We then are introduced to uh, the 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 Ramos family and the uh, Mark Anthony's American wife, played by Rada Mitchell, who is uh, I thought a very good actress who like you know had some juice in the I I, I remember her mainly from uh, Pitch Black. She was the hero in Pitch Black with Vin oh, Diesel. Yeah, and she was also in the Woody Allen movie uh, Melinda and Melinda. I think uh, I think she I think she's great. She's uh she's his American wife uh, Lisa, and she immediately likes uh, Denzel's character. Which, by the way, right now I sh we should introduce that his character's name is one of the, my favorite character names of all it's time insane. in a movie. John Creasy, and it's really weird <laughs> to have the name Creasy. Creasy, <laughs> it's, it's one letter away from Greasy. <laughs> yeah. It really makes me uncomfortable. And, um, uh, and like before, uh, Mark Anthony is like, okay, like, like if you if you like to drink, drink on your own time. But like, like my wife can never know about you being a drunk. Like, mm -hmm. don't don't bring it up in front of her. Don't drink in front of her. Rada Mitchell, when he when he she introduces herself to him, goes, "Would you like a drink?" And he goes, "Yeah, Jack Daniels, neat." <laughs> <laughs> and he just drinks it out of a pint glass, just drains yeah. it in front of her. But uh, she likes him immediately because he's not Mexican. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's an American. And here we are introduced to the precocious daughter of all precocious daughters, Pita, played by Dakota Fanning. Mm -hmm. This was really her breakout role. Um, and really, like, uh, uh, I mean, Dakota Fanning, like, isn't in movies at all anymore, but this was, like, a movie that, like, everyone noticed her because of how good a performance from a child She's actor really, she really comes good. out within this movie. Like, apparently, Denzel was blown away by her. Like, he felt like he wasn't acting with her, and she, like, avoids the trap of, like, overacting, like, mm -hmm. a, a, as a child actor. And uh, so she, he meets... Peta played by Dakota Fanning. Uh, she is precocious. She is as precocious as all get out. Now, Hessa, I know what you're thinking. Listener, I know what you're thinking. There is absolutely no way that this adorable little ragamuffin will melt the calloused heart of this hired killer. Mm -hmm. The chances of that happening, slim to none. Mm -hmm. Slim to none. I he mean, tells is, her that right off yeah. the bat. He's like, you know what? I'm not gonna, you're not, you're not gonna woo me. Your charms will not affect me. Here's something I'd like to note about the um the the the, the two main performances in this movie between Dakota Fanning and Denzel Washington. And this is what I mean about what an impressive performance it is from uh, Dakota Fanning. Because there is something distinctly flirtatious in Dakota's performance and the way she plays her relationship with Denzel. Like she's immediately taken by this, like, you know, sort of like morose older man. And there's a, a certain quality to her character of like a child who like spends way too much time around adults and not enough around kids her own age. So she sort of like acts older than she actually is mm -hmm. in an attempt to like sort of relate to and be friends with adults instead of kids. And there is something like, not sexual, but like definitely she's in love with him from like the minute they yeah, meet. Yeah, there's like a chemistry. I wouldn't call yeah. it sexual chemistry, but definitely like like a fatherly, daughterly, or even like older brother type. But I, I, I think like know. that's what like how he comes to, yeah, uh, to yeah, feel yeah. about it. But I think on Dakota's part, I think she is like in love with she him has in like a romantic. Crush on she him. has a real yeah, crush yeah. on him. She's like in love with him in like kind of both as a better father figure than Mark Anthony, but also as kind of like, you know, her boyfriend, really. Yeah, she keeps asking him like, do you have a girlfriend and stuff you like, have a girlfriend creasy 
Um, she says he's like a big sad bear. Mm-hmm. And then throughout the rest of the movie, she names her teddy bear after him and she starts calling him her crazy bear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> her greasy bear. Yeah. <laughs> she loves hanging out with a big greasy bear. And also, um, when Denzel first sees his like room in this um like compound, he sees that there's like this bird. And they're like, Oh yeah, that was the last bodyguard, Emilio's bird. So have fun. <laughs> have fun taking care of this bird forever. <laughs> so you know, Denzel, he's uh, like, you know, he's, he's happy to have work, but he's like, you know, still a like a completely depressed uh, basket case. Um, so like, what do you do on your what do you do your first night on the job? Just, you know, drink a bottle of Jack Daniels, stare at a parrot and take a gun apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just play with a gun. You know, that's what you do it's when you're a, like every night for him is the beginning of Apocalypse <laughs> Now. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um. Uh, and then, like, he, he he lets the parrot go almost immediately. I also love, I, I have to mention here, the house in Mexico City that the Ramos family lives in is so dope. It's like, so it, sick. It's just like, this is, is like some high-level property porn going on. They have a gorgeous pool in the backyard. It definitely belongs to a real cartel person, yeah, yeah, probably. Well, yeah. well, like, every Mexican <laughs> businessman, there also needs to be a gigantic room that's like the household shrine to the Virgin de Guadalupe with, like, 8,000 candles in it. yeah. There's um, a stuffed zebra in the living room and like an incredible chandelier and like yeah. the main foyer. Like it's it's a gorgeous house. And oh, also in the scene where Creasy gets his room, Dakota Fanning says to him, what's your favorite music? And he's like, I don't like music. I- <laughs> and that, that'll come into play later. Yeah. But there's no way there has a there is no way that this guy's ever going to like music. He really doesn't like yeah. music. He really doesn't. <laughs> and, he ne- and he never will. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, the next day uh, he drops off. um Pita Dakota Fanning at her at her beautiful Mexico City school. Uh, it's you know run by uh, nuns. It's like you know uh, it's a Catholic school. And then he meets a uh, sister Anna, who's this like you know wizened nun. And she's like you know don't take offense, Mister Creasy, but like I wish your I wish your profession didn't have to exist. And he's like you and me both, sister. And she says, do you ever see the hand of God in what you do? And then he impresses her by spitting some Bible shit at her. He's, mm-hmm. he's like, oh, like I know that Bible verse. And, it's in, and he says it in Spanish. That's like Romans 23, 17. He's like, I'm uh, the lamb that got lost. Yeah, sister. yeah. <laughs> and he goes, Over, uh, overcome evil with good. And yeah, I go, sister, I'm, yeah, I'm the, I'm the sheep that got lost, Madre. Mm-hmm. And so like while she's in school, he goes to a street market and buys music for the first time in his life. Mm-hmm. He hears the, the sweet sounds of Linda Ronstadt. Oh, I mean, who could pot... Uh, like, the hardest heart could be melted by by Linda Ronstadt. Mm-hmm. And he picks up Blue Bayou, and you know, so like he he, buy, he buys the record, and then he goes and picks up Pita after school, and then she immediately starts drilling him with questions in the way that like kids do when they're being annoying. They're mm-hmm. like, "Did you like school? Uh, what was your school like?" And then she starts getting a little bit more personal. He like hates answering questions, so she goes, she cranks it up even higher, and she goes. Uh, were you unhappy as a child? Yeah, she's like, being black as a bodyguard in Mexico City, is that an advantage or a disadvantage? What happened to your hand? And his hand his is like, like... covered with cigarette burns, probably yeah. self-inflicted cigarette burns. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, uh, it's a birthmark. And she's like, no, it's not, Greasy. <laughs> and, and, then he, and then he cuts her down and says, look, I'm paid to protect you. I don't want to be your friend. This is only a job to me. And as this is happening... Tony Vision starts. Yeah. <laughs> we start blinking into Tony Vision a yeah. little bit. Because like, you know, like uh, there's like squeegee men and it's Mexico yeah, City. Yeah. And it's like, it's scary. Someone trying to sell them roses. Someone else <laughs> yeah. trying to sell them like eggs. Like, yeah. Their e- car e- For an American in 2004, evil, scary shit going on. Yeah, that's, yeah, like, yeah. Mexico, Mexicans existing and like living in a city. He literally pulls his gun and t- takes the safety off <laughs> when <laughs> there's like someone cleaning his windshield with a newspaper. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta stay frosty at all times. Mm-hmm. And I suppose this would be a good time to bring up the fact that like, look, if you are Mexican or live in Mexico City, I could very much imagine not liking this movie because it is a horrible portrayal it's of, like worse than sicario <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like really this is bad a really horrible portrayal of uh, both mexico city and the entire like nation and people of mexico yeah because like with a few exceptions every mexican in this movie is just about the most like awful venal like someone who would sell their own child for a buck yeah truly <laughs> like and like that everyone is just being kidnapped at every moment just like a human life is worthless it's just like it, 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 the the anti kidnapping division of the police are the ones who kidnap and ransom you. It's just like yeah. a level of awful evil corruption. And like I said, like this is very much this, this is two thousand four. 
this wasn't like this was an Iraq war was still going good or people thought it was like people were starting to turn on it. But like this is like the height of like George W. Bush war on terror America where like everything outside the borders of the United States is just like Hell. a terrifying nightmare. And if you're an American, you will be like spotted, kidnapped, tortured. The one killed. the yeah. one good Mexican is a, an Italian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so so he's he's sort of he's very cold to Peta, and then like it, like while the squeegee men are assaulting the car, she gets out of the front seat, and he thinks she's like gonna run away, but she just gets in the back seat, mm-hmm. which I thought was nice because she was like, oh, you're just gonna be my bodyguard. Well, I'll treat you like one. Yeah, driving Miss Daisy style. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. how do you like being black now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, then he goes home, and he has he talks to the mom. And the mom is like, hey, you were kind of mean to my daughter, and he's like, I don't even I don't care. <laughs> And because uh, he's already starting to get a uh, get get loaded, he's yeah. getting a buzz on. So yeah, like so like yeah, Rhonda Mitchell comes down and she's like, um, "Look, like you know, Peta, she just wants to be friends." And he's like, "Not gonna happen, lady." <laughs> yeah. So he's like, "All right, all right, no, no, the guy's got the, the this boss has crawled out of my ass. Time to time for some me time. So time to go on an epic bender." And now here we get this is crazy. Like here we get like the, the the this is the most intensely distilled like Tony Vision moment of the movie. This like, is peak Tony Scott of his career, maybe even. It's I mean this and the torture scene later in yeah. the, the movie. I because he puts on Blue Bayou and Blue Bayou plays normally for about three seconds, and then he takes a swig of Jack. And then Nine Inch Nails hit. And then it becomes then Nine hard... Inch Blue Bayou Nine Inch Nails remix. <laughs> Trent Literally. Reznor, Linda Ronstadt collab. Just like the hardest, craziest industrial music. As you see these like strobing images of Denzel's like agonized face is like, like let's say uh, cleaning a gun when you're depressed is uh, means one thing and one thing only. Uh-huh. So we see him just start playing with this bullet. He's like, oh, what if I put, the, what if I put it in the pipe? Okay, I'm doing that. What if I cock it? <laughs> what, if I cock what if I cock it and put it up to my head and pull the trigger? What if I cock it, put it to my put it to my head and pull the trigger? He pulls the trigger. He pulls the trigger, which is like a very like you really see that in a movie. And like, uh, but here's here's the deal: the bullet misfires. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't go it off. It doesn't go off. Failure to fire. And I love this. He's like, like basically a ghost. Like he was exp- he was expecting to be dead like ten minutes ago, and he instantly still- <laughs> Tony Vision turns off right <laughs> yeah, at that moment because yeah. he's like. What the oh, fuck, fuck, dude? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what was I doing? You know, they say people who like survive suicide attempts, they say like their last conscious thought before going under was regret. Mm-hmm. So he's like, maybe this, this is a wake up call for, for Creasy. And I love this. He calls walk in in the middle of the night and he's like, um, hey, uh, just real, real curious. Um, have you ever fired a gun and the bullet didn't go off? Just just randomly. I just wondering if that ever it's happened. It's like 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Hawkins like, yeah, I guy. It's rare, but I guess it happens. Called failure to fire. You know, a bullet you know, like the, never the, lies. The dimple on the pin, and he's like, uh, he's like, Creasy, um, what were you shooting at? And he's like, uh, I gotta it's go. Not, it's <laughs> Don't worry about it. You gotta go. And then, and then we get, and then we get like the, um, the uh, like Rashid Wallace quote of the movie: "The ball don't lie." In this movie, it's a bullet always tells the truth. So mm-hmm. he's just like, well, the the bullet didn't lie. Like, I guess apparently I have to keep on being alive. <laughs> yeah. And I have to start taking my job seriously. And like, he, and he does. Cause the next day as they're driving to school, he notices a car is tailing them and he writes down the license number. Or he tries to, but he can't because, um, of the crazy traffic in Mexico. They, they don't know how to build roads over there. So, <laughs> they, um, the crazy traffic, um, he doesn't get the number down, but Dakota Fanning notices what he's doing and gets the number down in her diary. diary. Mm-hmm. And apparently, there's another little like method acting thing. Apparently, Dakota Fanning, that's actually all her real handwriting. And like she did as part of her character in the movie, wrote a diary where she wrote, I love Creasy over and over again. Yeah, like, I love six, Creasy Bear. <laughs> I love Creasy Bear like 600 times. Um, and then we're introduced to the fact that um, Peta is a swimmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she's not very good. She's too slow off the block. Well, she's fastest in the water, too slow off the block. But, and, you know, like, Creasy sees this, but I bet he doesn't give a shit and has no interest in getting involved in this. Yeah, no, no, no. Like, Nothing's going to no come of that. Nothing's oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, no. He's helping her. And, like, mm-hmm. he, he becomes her swim coach. Her big swim meet is in three weeks. That's hardly enough time to heal his wounded, traumatized heart. So at, at this point, like, uh, when he, uh, now that he's no longer suicide, a suicidal alcoholic anymore, uh, we see some news footage and we're introduced to the character of the crusading Mexican journalist played by uh, Rachel Ticotin, who you may remember from um, Total Recall. 
Mm-hmm. He's the uh, the the quote to quote Arnold. He likes some sleazy. Oh shit! And R- Rachel T- uh, Tikatin is uh, the the cool rebel. The cool rebel in Total Recall. She was also in Falling Down. She plays a cop in that movie. And in this movie, she is a uh, crusading journalist who's like trying to shed some light on this epidemic of kidnappings in Mexico and the corrupt police and government that are covering it up, if not profiting from it. Mm-hmm. So then, um, oh, uh, Creasy's parrot comes back. Uh, Peta says goodnight to him. There's a scene where she dances with and kisses her creasy bear. Like I said, like there's this sort of like yeah. there's a real romance going on. A, 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 mm-hmm. I'll say it's like a one way romance. Like uh, yeah, like I don't, I don't read Denzel's character like he's on some sus shit or anything. But like yeah, yeah, yeah. But but Dakota Fanning is clearly like it, like in love with him. Like yeah, she's it's in like a child with him. Yeah. Like, crush. You know, like we're gonna get married someday. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the next day, her uh, dad and mom go on a business trip to Detroit. And what do you do when you're rich? You go away on business. And you leave your young daughter with an unstable alcoholic assassin who has now become yeah, her yeah, swimming yeah. coach. Uh-huh. <laughs> and we get In a, great... a city where they say at one point, there have been six kidnappings, or there have been 24 kidnappings in the last six days. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, he becomes her, uh, her swim coach, and he teaches her, this is the most important part about swimming, if you're afraid of gunfire, don't even try to be in track and field or swimming because mm-hmm. it's all about that gunshot. And there's a great scene, there's a great training montage where he teaches her how to like get fast off the block and he makes her yell, the gunshot holds no fear. The gunshot holds no fear. Yeah. The, no, the, no, you're not afraid of the gunshot. The sound sets you free. Mm-hmm. The gunshot it, sets you... The gu- it releases you from that block. You're a prisoner on the block and that sound sets you free. You love Gun, it. Guns will set everyone free. <laughs> yeah, truly. <laughs> We're all prisoners that a gun will set us free someday. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, there's a great scene that, like, gets into more of this. Um, another apparently improvised scene where she's doing homework and she goes, Creasy, can I ask you a question? And he goes, yeah, sure. And he goes, what's a concubine? <laughs> and he's like, well, <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, it's like a wife, but in the old time days. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And she's like, and then she starts asking him about his, like, you know, if he has a girlfriend. And he's like, yeah, I got none of you none of your business do your homework and she's like creasy you're smiling and there's a very like nice moment where they yeah. try to get each other not to smile they're arguing about who smiles first yeah and yeah it's they have such good chemistry in yeah no the, it's the, really fantastic they're really great i mean like that's this movie like because you know it, it is you know kind of a ridiculous like revenge movie that we've seen a lot of times before it's this like kind of very 2004 american view of the world yeah it's very reactionary but i think like what really like anchors this movie and makes it like much better than the sum of its parts is, I think, Denzel Washington and Dakota Fanning's. And mm-hmm. their, like, their chemistry and the way, like, their performances, I think, are great. And Dakota Fanning is such a good child. I mean, from also from this era, the movie Uptown Girls, if you've ever seen it. I haven't seen that one. Shot by Michael Ballhaus. Um, and it's, like, Dakota Fanning and Brittany Murphy. And that's really good. This is a Hesse recommendation. If anyone <laughs> wants to see Uptown Girls, the opposite of this movie in many ways. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, she's like, "Do you have a girlfriend, Creasy?" Then they're like, "They're they're training to swim again." And then like, he he makes her say, "I'm trained, Creasy." And he goes, there, "There's no such thing as tough. There's only trained and untrained. Which are you?" And she goes, "I'm trained, Creasy." <laughs> so he goes to her swim beat. It's been three weeks, and like he's already become both her father and boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And then even like Sister Anna from the school is like. Senor Creasy, like today you are her father. And he's yeah. like, no way. Yeah, <laughs> I never like, thought this would be me. Yeah. <laughs> and what does she do? She wins her swim meet. Mm-hmm. So as her reward for winning her big, sw- big swim meet, she gets to hang out with two broken old men, Denzel yes. Washington and Christopher Walken. Uh-huh. And she like, she loves it. She loves just hearing these two old guys talk, talk about shop, like, just yeah. talk shop. <laughs> And she gets him a present. She gets him a bear, and he opens it up, and there's a little St. Jude medallion inside it. St. Jude, of course, being the, the patron, patron saint, saint of, of Lost, Lost Causes. causes. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he's back at the house, and like he, he gets this, this heartfelt gift from his new daughter slash <laughs> underage girlfriend. And he's like looking at that bottle of Jack Daniels. He opens it. Then he puts the cap on, puts it down, and picks up the Bible instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then... um. Peta tries telling Mark Anthony that um, she's just like, look, Dad, I don't want to do piano lessons. I want to swim. And he's like, it's not up for discussion, honey. You know, like you have this audition with this great teacher, and he's like a world, acc- he's a world acclaimed piano teacher. And if he takes you on, you'll be a wonderful concert pianist. And she's like, but I want to swim. I want to be trained by Creasy Bear. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so the next day, uh, Denzel takes her to a piano lesson and he tells her to like how to get out of it by like belching yeah. and being rude and kind of like he'll he'll drop you and then you'll be back in the pool. He'll offend 20- his sensibility. You'll be back in the pool in 24 hours. So yeah. he drops her off at the piano lesson. She gives him a little flower to put in his lapel. Mm-hmm. He's looking at it. He he takes her new dog out for a walk and he's like having a having a nice sit on the park bench. And he's thinking to himself, hey, maybe my life isn't totally fucked and I can be a human being again. And then cop car rolls by. Slow motion. Nice piano music is playing in the background. Claire no, Deloon. A bell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Debussy is playing in the background. And then, uh, and then you hear a bell toll, and it's just like, oh no, oh, shit. Tony Vision. Oh, we got fuck. Tony Vision. It goes real high contrast all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah, like, like, all the oh, fucking no. color is it's drained out of it. Everything gets deep fried. You're in that. You're in the bad place. You're in, you're in Tony Vision again. So bad shit is about to happen. The cop car rolls by. As soon as she gets out of her piano lesson, the kidnapping goes down. Um, like he, he, he fires in the air, like the starting block to get her to run. Mm-hmm. And she runs away, but like there are cops involved in it. He just, like, he kills like four guys. Yeah, he he kills, domes two of them cops. He just, two, like, two of them are cops. He kills two of the other kidnappers, but he gets shot. He gets shot like four he times. He gets air hold. He, yeah, gets, he gets blown yeah. away. Like he gets shot like four times in the chest. And, as the Kona Fanning's running away, like she could get away, but she sees her creasy bear and he's going down and she runs back to him. Mm-hmm. She runs back to try to save him. And of course, she gets taken. Mm-hmm. Denzel, he's nearly dead. He wakes up in a Mexican hospital surrounded by cops and the media. He's been charged with the murder of several cops and is blamed for the kidnapping. That's when uh, Rachel Ticatin shows up to ask the corrupt police chief about, hey, um, could you comment on the fact that of the two officers involved in this, the two dead officers involved in this kidnapping, um, how come they were in uniform but off duty at the time? And they were driving kidna- a patrol car at the scene of a kidnapping? <laughs> yeah. and That's really like, weird. <laughs> he's he's like, like, all I know is they died bravely. Yeah, he does Jen Psaki mode. He's yeah. like, yeah, we're not going to speak on that at this time. Then we get our boy Giancarlo Gianni shows yeah. up. And like he has like a previous relationship with Rachel, Rachel Ticketin because he feels her ass. Mm, he, he grabs her he ass. Grabs her ass and gives, her like, little, oh. gives her a little pinch, you know. He's like, they were corrupt cowards. And, yeah. uh, now they are die as heroes. And <laughs> yeah. uh, the whole press pool laughs. They somehow heard him, even they're though like, he whispered it. Oh, they're like, our <laughs> yeah. country is so evil and corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> our cops are kidnapping little girls and for money. The like, guy giving the press conference is like, <clears throat> anyways, the memorial will be held. <laughs> so, uh, Back at home, um, you know, it, the, the, the house is a, you know, beehive of activity. Rada Mitchell's obviously a mess. Her daughter has been kidnapped. Uh, Mickey Rourke is back. Uh, J- Jordan Kalfas is the name of Mickey Rourke's character. Yeah. He's back to negotiate the ransom. Now, uh, and he's a really good guy and a really good lawyer. You <laughs> yeah, can tell. Listener, listener, let me ask you this. Um, when Mickey Rourke shows up in a movie wearing a five thousand dollars suit and like sort of laboriously lighting cigars, smoking a cigar everywhere, smoking a cigar everywhere, as like the lawyer who's going to negotiate the uh, ransom of your kidnapped child, you have, you have would you bet about. that he's a good guy or a bad guy? You have nothing to worry about, Mark Anthony. Don't worry, <laughs> just leave it to me. We don't need the police involved. Look, so and then we see um, uh, a cop that we saw in the opening uh, Scott Bode montage, the sort of like the, the fat Mexican mustache cop who's like with the anti-kidnapping division and Mickey Rourke tells him like, hey, like, yeah, thanks for showing up or anything, but the family has chosen this to handle it themselves. And he goes, uh, senor, I'm sorry, but like there are two cops are killed in the commission of this kidnap. So we have a mandate from like the Mexican attorney general that we have to participate in this investigation. Yeah, sorry, homie, but we've got to steal the ransom. I mean, uh, <laughs> we have to help you make sure they get the ransom And then he, he tells him like, you know, follow their instructions. And he says, if you don't, there's a funny line here. He says, you'll, if you don't, you'll find yourself in a real Mexican in hell no mariachi no tequila and no pita and no siestas <laughs> <laughs> no tacos <laughs> no. So, <laughs> uh so then like you know the family gets the do you love your daughter phone call and we see like clips of the the voice like the arch villain in this movie like the head kidnapper who's calling he's like you know like sort of like a Lugubriously smoking cigarettes as he lounges in his house, surrounded by like all his kids. Or I mean, yeah, like, they're someone's kids, but it's a real contrast because they're all having ha- they're having they're having fun and playing, and he's just hanging out by the pool. And he's like, because yeah, he has a bunch of kids. Not, we not, see him yeah. later. Yeah, not now, not now. Daddy's doing business on the phone. Yeah, Daddy kidnapped a kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But she, she's just like you, but we're gonna cut her ear off. That actor who plays the voice is so good. He's yeah, like he's clearly yeah. in it, but he really does like 
a really good performance. The call later on, the next call he's on, is even better. Like, uh, yeah, oh, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, and 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 I, and I like that. Um, uh, he's like, he's like, hey, look, he's like, I'm a professional. If you just like, like, if you give us the money, we'll give you your daughter back unharmed. But if you deviate from my instructions in any way. I swear by the Virgin de Guadalupe, like you will never see your daughter again. And then I love Mark Gendon. He's like, oh, he's like, sir, sir, I, I also worship the Virgin de Guadalupe. And I just want to say, like, uh, like I, I Yo, feel you're like Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, they're like, dumbass, we're Mexican. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> so uh, while this is going on, uh, Creasy, of course, is in bad shape in the hospital. And mm-hmm. Giancarlo Gianni. Uh, moves him from a hospital to like a private residence because he's like, you know, you killed two corrupt cops. Like the hospital would be the easiest place to kill you. Oh, also before we move on, when the police are like setting up inside um, the Ramos family's home, they have like sticky notes all over like, and they put like all these sticky notes on the stuffed zebra. Did you notice that? <laughs> yes. Like, hundreds of sticky notes that probably say like, Kidnapped a daughter. <laughs> Kidnapped <laughs> daughter? Question mark? <laughs> Z- on a zebra. <laughs> <Like>. <laughs> so the ransom is for uh, $10 million. Uh, Mickey Rourke takes instructions uh, for how, how they're going to pull off this money drop. But oops, the money drop gets robbed. Mm-hmm. Um, and they got to take... This is a bad phone call to have to take. Yeah, <laughs> this is yeah, a yeah, really yeah. bad phone call. Look, 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 look. <laughs> <laughs> really sorry the please <laughs> so they got it they, they get the call back and they're like uh, not only not only has, has the money been robbed but the, the the voice the head kidnapper his nephew was killed during the robbery of this mm-hmm. so he's just basically like uh your pita is dog food like, yeah it's like it, and that, this is when rada mitchell like screams she's like everyone get out she grabs the phone away from her dipshit feckless husband and she's like pleading with this guy like mm-hmm. please like just like don't hurt my daughter and he says like you know i wish we could have ma'am i'm sorry yeah i goes, wish we could have talked earlier yeah, i wish we could have talked earlier maybe we could have avoided this but it's too late now yeah <laughs> hangs up and it's really good because you do hear like he, a, sa- he says in spanish god be with your daughter and like the dynamic subtitling it stays on the screen uh-huh and it's just like the dead phone line dead daughter Ooh, bad just Real Rada tough. Mitchell slaps every single cop in her house <laughs> yeah. and is like, get the fuck out of my house. And um, yeah, now it's uh, it's fallen on Walken to deliver. Yeah. Walken's uh, got a, you know, he's recovering in a, like a like a, a like a vet, veterinary clinic or something. Yeah. Walken has to tell him. Um, yeah. Pete is dead. Like mm-hmm. yeah, your reason for living. She's been brutally murdered by, you know, a kidnapping gang. Mm-hmm. Um, so. You know, he's like, he's like, look, I've arranged for you to go home. Like, you're out of the hospital. Like, uh, they're not going to charge you because, you know, they would raise too many questions. But he's like, is he going to go home? Nope. He's mm-hmm. going right back to the crime scene where uh, the, the journalist, Rachel uh, Ticotin, um, uh, approaches him and tells him that the, the kidnapping gang has put a curse on him. Yeah. Now, apparently this was uh, perhaps mirrors something that actually happened to the, uh, the film crew, like yes. filming this movie in Mexico City. They were told that they had been targeted for kidnapping. And yeah. Rada Mitchell's driver was carjacked at gunpoint during the filming of this movie. <laughs> and Denzel went everywhere in Mexico City with like six bodyguards. Yeah, like, surrounding him. Yeah. Yeah. Mickey Rourke didn't need bodyguards. He yeah. He, he, he was not drinking every night. Because you know? no one recognized yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> the Mexicans respect Mickey Rourke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the wrestler. He's the uh, luchador. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, then, they leave. And then he gets like, he gives walk in the shopping list yeah which i love he's like, he's like okay he's like can you can you help me and he goes yeah and he goes i'm gonna need these and he goes are you going to war and he's like yeah i'm thinking i'm going to war yeah yeah, yeah. you go to my like probably like one of my two favorite scenes in this movie where uh creasy comes home to like now the emptied emptied like sort of villa of the the ramos family comes to get his stuff and which is just basically like his Bible and gun. <laughs> yeah. And his Jack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like is, is, you know, confronted by, uh, the grief ruined mother to like, you know, bond over this horrible loss. And she goes like, she's sort of like, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do or like, you know, like how I'm going to go on. And she goes like, uh, what are you going to do? And he goes, what I do best. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> nine Inch Nails music kills. Let's him. fucking go. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah, the, like, you hear like, the Nine Inch Nails slowly bow, welling bow, up in the background. Bow, bow. And he goes, yeah, like, he's like, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Uh, yeah, anyone who was involved, anyone who profited from it, anyone who opens their eyes at me. And, she go, and then she just she kisses him on the cheek and goes, kill them all. She says, you kill them all. 
and then we're treated to one of my favorite things that you can have in any action movie a weapon buying montage oh yeah and like you know he's a, he's a, he's a, the like the the mexican gun store <laughs> like yeah the, me- the mexican gun dealer and he buys a fucking- he's at a bodega and he's like can you hand me that <laughs> he's AK-47? like Yo, let me get a rocket launcher <laughs> aki style <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's buying like cell phones, detonators, a fucking rocket launcher. Yeah. And so the first guy uh he goes after, um, he like he 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 gets the journalist to run a license plate number for him, the license plate that he uh he wrote down earlier in the movie, and then like with a with like missing the final digit, but they like they narrow it down to the guy I'll call Sunglasses Man, mm-hmm. who is the dude who actually like carried out the kidnapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tony Vision hits. He like a uh, t- sunglasses man gets up in the morning, uh, yawns, pours himself a cup of coffee. What a put, great day! <laughs> puts on his sunglasses. He's like, time to go to the kidnapping factory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He gets in his car. Denzel's already there with a gun to his head. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, basically, duct tapes his hands he, he to the drives, wheel. Yeah, he drives him to a dump. Duck takes his hands to the wheel and then cuts off his fingers and ear as Ayakoma one by one. And yeah. Hey Mickey, you're so fine plays over the radio. Yeah, this is one of the moments where it's like five songs within a minute. <laughs> yeah. Because um and this this part is so good. This is another like Tony Scott pop music utilized to supreme effect, you know, Tarantino style where he basically cuts off the guy's fingers and Oyakomo Vaz playing. Yeah. And it's like so fucking sick. This is one of my favorite scenes of oh, the whole it's, movie. It's so brutal. And like, yeah, he's got his like, he's got his fingers up on the steering wheel. And he's like, yeah, like, he's like, you don't tell me what I want to know. I'm going to cut off your fingers one by one. And then he takes this car's cigarette lighter and he goes, this is to cauterize, stop the bleeding when I'm done. So it's like, if you think you're going to pass out, think again. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah, we're yeah. stopping the bleeding. <laughs> he cuts off his fucking ear and... Okay, here's what I want to talk about. Like, this is the role and movie that, like, people think Training Day is. Yeah. Because, like, this is Denzel playing, like, unlike Training Day, where he is, like, you know, like a, like a, an arch villain that's just, like, he's too, he's too badass and villainous to really be, like, believable in a way. Yeah. Whereas this, he's, like, he seems way more like a real person who has also killed hundreds of people. Yeah. And, like, there's something about, like, because in Training Day, he's just badass. And yeah. he's just constantly spitting like insults and he's just always like oh, quick on the draw. He's like, like Tom Cruise and collateral. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Of. He's just like the like the coolest evil guy ever. Yeah. And in this movie, like I said, he's a very like broken, like melancholy person, but like someone who's even scarier than Denzel in Training Dead. And the, the in the torture scenes in this movie, and like three of them in a row, the way like Denzel's sadistic kindness to the people that he's going to execute is so terrifying and it's excellent. Like crazy. Like, like, I think in this one, the guy says something smart ass to him and he has no reply. He just like smiles and laughs and then just cuts off the first finger. <laughs> he's like, and then at the end, we're like, sunglasses, man. He's like, he's, he's divulged everything that like he has to tell about the voice. And then like the second layer of kidnap of the kidnapping scheme are what they're called the guardians. It's like, mm-hmm. they, like, he's like, he look, I get the order. I take, I kidnap the person, and then I hand them off to these like the middlemen who will sort of keep them safe. And like no, and each of these like each, each of the divisions of big kidnapping LLC yeah. are sort of compartmentalized. No one knows who anyone else is. Yeah, like, he's like who's at the top, and the guy is like knows that he's about to like die and get all his fingers cut off. Yeah. So he's just like fucking slamming his head against <laughs> yeah, the yeah. fucking um, horn. And then and then at the end he's like he's like you know, uh, can I just have a cigarette? And he's like, you want a cigarette? Sure. All right, buddy. You're like, yeah, he, like, he, very nicely. Like he's like missing several fingers and an ear mm-hmm. lights up a cigarette for him. And he's like, well, let uh, him take two puffs. Let's <laughs> take, take a cup. Yeah. Get, 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 fill his lungs with some nicotine. Feeling pretty good. And then he's just like, well, that's it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just shoots him dead and straight in the head. Yeah. And then pushes the car off a cliff. And it's, re- it pans back. And this dump is on the edge of a Looney Tune style cliff. <laughs> Yeah. And then it's it like so crazy. the car the car flips in midair and lands like upside down and then it's like explodes in a huge fireball in the middle of like a kid's soccer field. Yeah, so there like are children de- playing <laughs> soccer below. And then it cuts into Denzel and he says, Revenge is a meal best served cold. <laughs> and it's like, all right, man. So <laughs> Yeah, it seemed pretty hot Let's to go. me. I don't know. But he, he is very cold in the way. And then like he gets oh, yeah. he gets his next target, which is a rave. And it's here where like he finds out that like uh, the welcome to the rave agent forty seven <laughs> <laughs> your target <laughs> and you know it, it's here where he finds out that like uh, the cops like the anti kidnapping cops are the ones who robbed 
the money drop in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so, like, uh, the, the fat mustache cop of the anti-kidnapping unit. You should, actually, they should call that the kidnapping unit instead. Yeah, literally. The, um, also, when he sees some more of his sadistic kindness, he goes into the rave, and he's in, like, the back room or whatever, and um, there's, like, an American guy yeah. there, and he's like, where are you from? And the guy's like, I'm from New Jersey. And he's like, you're from New Jersey? Me too. He's like, you're from Jersey? I'm from Jersey too, man. Right. How about that? And I'm like, gonna, he's like, did you say goodbye to her before oh um, God, before, yes. you, she, before goes, you killed her? He's like, the guy's what? Like, this is like this fat, sweaty guy. He's like, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. Making, he's like, you're making me really nervous right now. And man. he's like, well, <laughs> you didn't say goodbye to her? Go ahead and say goodbye now. And holds up a picture of her. <laughs> he's like, no, man. No. All right. And then just executes her. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And then he like, uh, but. There, there's like another girl in, yeah. their, in their kidnapping closet that uh, he has to see. He has to save, and then R.I.P. Denzel kills the club. He gets everyone out by <laughs> blowing off a shotgun <laughs> a few times in the air. The like opens up the gas line, pours gas everywhere, throws. No a one match. stops dancing. No one stops, I love it when like uh, the first time he raises the shotgun and blows it off in the air. Everyone just cheers. Everyone's like woo. He does it like four times, yeah. and they cheer every single time. They don't stop dancing. And they then just everyone, go outside. Everyone gets out to like the the street in front of the club. Then the whole club blows up. Everyone cheers again. Yeah, <laughs> it's like this is the best rave ever. <laughs> Yo, Mexico is so cool. The club will just explode for no reason. <laughs> like they act like it's something that happens all the time. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. Once again, this movie's portrayal of Mexico is just it's like, very, very. It's like bad. the entire nation of Mexico is just like the Saw movies. Yeah, that's, it's that's, like if you're at a children's <laughs> soccer game in Mexico, there's a chance that a Looney Tunes <laughs> car will fall and explode on the field with a man with no fingers duct taped to but, the wheel. Um, he, he gets his next target, which is of course the quote unquote anti kidnapping cop. Mm-hmm. And then we get the great scene with Christopher Walken and uh, Gianni. Where Walken does the, the the great Walken line, where he's just like uh, young Carlo. He's like he's a member of like the Mexican Feds or a former Interpol. He's like yeah. He's sort of like uh, he's a, he's with the the federal agencies that are of course the one good cop yeah, in they're, Mexico they're above being corrupted. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So he goes like you know, Senor Rayburn. He's like I just want to uh, I want to understand like who this man is because they're like they're beginning to understand that like look, we can't get at this, like what's called the brotherhood of like corrupt cops and politicians. Las Hermanadad or Las Hermanadad. <laughs> And but but Creasy is like, you know, he can go places we can't like we can basically just use him as like a battering ram for our larger investigation. And he asked Rayburn, like, so wh- wh- what's this Creasy guy's deal? Here? Yeah, yeah. And walking. What's what the hell's going on? We got a great we got we got great like prime like late in his career, but prime walk in where he just mm-hmm. goes, a man, a man can be an artist. It could be food. It's just it depends on how good he is at it. Creasy's art is death. <laughs> and he's about to paint his masterpiece. <laughs> I got nothing else to say. He's like, and if, look, if you're smart, you'll stay out of his way. And Janini's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, don't worry. I will. <laughs> so then like, they're like, okay, how are you going to get at this cop? He lives in like a judicial district. He and travels, travels by motorcade. He travels everywhere by motorcade. Like the Mexican president has less security than this guy. Is there are pro- three guys guarding him. <laughs> <laughs> he takes he takes out the motorcade with a rocket launcher. He fires it from like a second story window, and then just walk like they're like, "Oh fuck, we just got hit with a rocket launcher." And then he just walks into the street and just starts shooting the guys as they pour out of the the clown car of like, yeah. <laughs> the Mexican security detail. Well, my um, I also love when he's setting up with the rocket launcher. He's in this like building, and he's like setting up this like RPG, and um. It like the camera pans over and there are two of the oldest people in the world sitting <laughs> on like a couch and they're just like, why are you going to kill someone? Don't you think you should forgive them? And then um, he says uh, one of the best lines in this movie, if not the best line, he says, um, it's God's job to forgive him. My job is to arrange the meeting. Badass. And I was like, yo, Badass. let's fucking go. <laughs> so uh, he, he, he kidnaps the anti-kidnapping cop and we get to what I think is the best scene in the movie. This my, is so good. My favorite scene in the movie. So imagine this. Uh, your motorcade has just been uh, blown up with a rocket launcher. You've been summarily grabbed off the street, uh, blindfolded, like knocked out. And then you wake up to find yourself uh, naked, spread eagle, and handcuffed to the uh, hood of your car. And you feel, I don't know, 
uh, some pressure in your lower abdomen, mm -hmm. shall we say? And then Denzel explains to him that he has given him a. I feel kind of horny for some reason. <laughs> the guy is like wakes up. My prostate feels great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Denzel has given this guy a C4 suppository. Mm -hmm. He is like he's loaded like uh, what's called a, like a charger, and he's like convicts use this to like you know keister drugs and money into prison. So you're probably aware of that. But you got one up your asshole right now with uh, a brick of C4 and like a timer on it. Yeah, and he goes like you know this. Is a cheap watch here. It sends it said pages in four and a half minutes. It's gonna send a page to that bomb in your asshole. So you better get start start talking. And the guy spills his shit, and then he's like, Snake. and then the on screen. It's, this is one of my the favorite examples. Clock. Yes, because, yes. The, uh, he has an on screen countdown clock to this guy's asshole exploding. It's like two minutes forty seconds, one minute thirty seconds. Yeah. So like this guy, um, he spills like you know as you imagine you would. This he's, guy's very cool <laughs> under pressure for what's yeah. going on right now <laughs> in his life. <laughs> this guy spills everything. Uh, and also, I really love in this scene, um, uh, as he's explaining to him his um, asshole bomb, he's cleaning off his hands with wet wipes. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, he takes, it cuts to him and Denzel's like looking at the highway when it first cuts to them. And he's wearing rubber gloves and he like latex gloves and he takes them off. And it's like, it's kind of funny, the idea that he would keep those on for like a while after. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's going back to his, uh, the uh, agent Doug Carlin. He's like, mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's C4. Come. That's come. That's, that's come. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, uh, he spilled, like, the, the, the Fuentes, the uh, corrupt cop, spills everything on, on the voice, but not before divulging him, divulging to him that yes, the money we, they stole... We stole the money, but it was... It was not $10 million. It was $2.5 million. The money was already stolen before the drop by Mickey Rourke, which, once again... Mm -hmm. Folks, don't let Mickey Rourke handle your finances or legal, yeah. or any legal matter. Just, just anyone other than Mickey Rourke, please. Yeah. Um, so like he, he spills on him, and then we get a great the, my favorite moment of the movie where he's like, uh, "Senor, Senor, what now?" And he goes like, and he goes like, "Nothing, nothing now. <laughs> I'm walking away. You got about forty <laughs> seconds left." And he goes, uh, "Last wish." And he goes, "I wish, I wish you had more time." And he walks away, and it's like the best moment of like badass guy walking away from an explosion. This guy's asshole explodes, and I'm like, that's the man on fire. The whole yep. kind of boom, <laughs> and then you see him just walking away, framed in like the flames of this guy exploding. That's the man on fire. Mm -hmm. That's the man on fire. Then we cut to like my favorite um, sort of like dynamic subtitle in this movie, where it just goes Jordan Kalfas residence. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, they're like, oh shit, Jordan Kalfas' house. And this is the scene that got cut. Uh, like Denzel shows up there and Mickey Rourke is already dead. Headless, in, yeah, headless floating in the pool. In his swimming pool. And, like, and this also, this whole time it keeps intercutting to um, uh, Dakota Fanning swimming in um, like an Olympic swimming pool and Denzel also swimming in the same swimming pool with blood just gushing yeah, from all the bullet yeah. wounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he's a bodyguard. He's not a pool. He's not a yeah, pool yeah, cleaner, yeah. you know. So but someone, it's like someone else's problem. A fun symbolic, like, you know, it's like the music video type stylings of this movie where it's like, you know, the symbolic, like he's drowning and like dying. And, and yeah, like and, and Tony Scott directed a lot of music videos, too. And I think mm -hmm. like his music videos and commercials are really where he honed like the Tony vision. Oh, yeah. And then like use it as a means to like, like experiment with a style that he would then introduce to his feature films. And like, you know, like this movie is like the prime example of that. Of this, like, yeah, like, of this kind of, like, hyper-modernist, like, kind of pop consumerist style, but then transposed into these kind of, like, like yeah, like I said, the very idiosyncratic and, like, uh, dark. Sort of like, dark and kind of, like, grounded action films. Yeah. So then, uh, back at the Ramos residence, uh, we got, got another really awkward conversation between husband and wife here, because, uh, surprise, surprise, it's dad Mark Anthony set up his own daughter to be kidnapped and ransomed mm -hmm. with Mickey Rourke, because he's, like... Honey, you don't under you don't understand how hard it is to be uh, a rich guy in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. like, you don't get it. My dad used to pray here every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's like, he I don't goes, give a fuck. He, like Mark Anthony's like, after he's admitted that he is responsible for the death, the kidnapping, and murder of his own daughter, and he goes, "Do you have a wife, Creasy?" And he goes, "No." Then you don't know how hard it is to kidnap a child with your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I I really love um in this scene like weird because it takes place in the shrine area yeah and you see uh mark anthony and his wife and like literally fucking in the shrine area yeah. earlier in the movie basically and there's this like weird ever presence of this like religious element where mark anthony's like no no i love like 
you don't get it. This was all for like good. Like I thought she would be watching cartoons and like <laughs> yeah. drinking juice boxes all day. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> didn't you read all the news stories about all the other yeah. kidnappings that go down in Mexico? Like, and another important... rarely has someone returned and be like, oh, it wasn't so bad. I was hanging out by the pool. They let me watch some telenovelas. It was great. Because another important thing is that like it's um it's kidnapping insurance is where the money came from. Yeah. The ten mil. And so he's like stealing it. I don't know how they don't really explain how they were going to get the kid back after yeah, giving after them. They didn't give the money in the first place. Yeah, a fourth of the money. <laughs> it's like, it makes no sense. Uh, uh, he, he, folks, he's a bad dad. Rourke is he, so convincing. <laughs> you don't know yeah, yeah, <laughs> the way he yeah. pitched it. <laughs> Dude, when you see a guy with cufflinks that big smoke a cigar that yeah. coolly, you tend to believe him. Let's not pay. <laughs> what if we don't pay. It's going to be fine. Don't worry. What if instead of paying, what if instead of paying the kidnappers, we didn't pay them and kept the money <laughs> ourselves? But and we'll, then we get hey, the kid back. We we'll still get the kid back. We don't give the money. We get the kid back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um. So, uh, Rada Mitchell is obviously uh, upset by the revelation <laughs> that her husband murdered her daughter. Yeah. So, how do they solve this problem? Creasy is like, look. Once again, I'm gonna kill him with kindness. He's like, I'm not gonna brutally murder you like the last couple guys I've just ran through. Uh, I'm going to give you a, an empty gun and I'm going to give you the bullet that didn't work on me and I'm going to leave you two alone and you guys, like, you guys just sit with that for a little bit and you and the bullet and the gun figure out what you need to do. <laughs> this, I feel like there's a deleted scene here because he, the bullet is in Dakota Fanning's diary. Yeah. Why did he give her a bullet? <laughs> what? Did Dad shit. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> His okay. boyfriend, boyfriend <laughs> slash dad shit. It's He's, like um, those paperweights that are bullets that like right wing companies yeah, yeah. sell. <laughs> yeah, like a lighter that looks like a hand grenade. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, like uh, Mark Anthony gets the picture. He uh, kills himself in front of the uh, version to Guadalupe. And mm-hmm. Basically, Denzel is officially Dakota Fanning's father now. Yeah, even though she's dead. Mm-hmm. Or or, or is maybe she? wait. Okay, uh, so Denzel is obviously not done yet because they're still the voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget how, but they like. Tracked that like through the ATM card that like the guy the the, yes, the guy from he, New Jersey gave him when he goes to the rave he gets the ATM card then um the reporter gives it to Janini and he like they print it in the newspaper so they put this guy on blast like yeah like, they put his picture in the newspaper she gets threatened too before that she's they're like don't publish this picture and in the very next scene she's like by the way Denzel check the front page of the newspaper you'll see a picture of the guy <laughs> and he's like all right okay well that, yeah <laughs> so um getting to the end here like denzel uh he basically he kidnaps uh the voices younger brother like he gets the address he goes to his house um he gets shot in the process but he makes his younger brother he makes the younger brother uh call his kidnapping older brother and he's like hold on your brother wants to talk to you and he's like hola and then he blows off his fingers with a shotgun yeah. while he's on the phone with him yeah and you know then look not so fun to be on the other end of that call is it mr kidnapping Mm -hmm. man you know yeah literally yeah and he's also there with the kidnapping guy's pregnant wife and like six kids yeah and he's like oh maybe you should uh give me what i want (laughs) he's like which is you (laughs) i want you to be dead and he goes like he's like how much money do you want that's when he blows off the guy's fingers yeah and he like hangs up he calls him back and you know denzel he doesn't want his money he wants him yeah like that's the trade he's gonna make but the voice still has one big bargaining chip left, and that is that PETA is still alive mm-hmm. and wants her creasy bear. And they use the creasy bear as like a proof of life. He's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Ask her what she calls her teddy bear and tell her to tell me. And it's creasy bear. I was a little confused why they kept her alive at this point. Yeah, he's like, he's, does, like, really doesn't. he's like, he's like, I'm a businessman. Like a dead kid is the, not, we can still, and but it's like, isn't this just a huge liability to have this girl still alive yeah, around? It's really like, crazy. like, send her to Aiden Quinn's whorehouse. What or are they going like to do for the next, like, wait till she's 18 <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. let her go? <laughs> like, what? They just saw young Dakota Fanning and they were like, she's a star. Yeah. She's got, <laughs> she's got it. She's you know? got the magic touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, they arrange a life for a life swap, but it's actually two lives for one life because he's, he's yeah. going to give him his younger brother and himself yeah. in exchange for... We're like, uh, we want to torture family. you to death, honestly, yeah. Creasy, because you're annoying as hell. <laughs> yeah. like, you've killed, you've fucked up our whole kidnapping operation. Now there's mm-hmm. only one kidnapping every two hours in Latin America, yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks to you. And so they go to the bridge. Like He, he, get, he gets Rada Mitchell and he's like, he tells her that her daughter is still alive. And, and she's it, like, I'm so sick of this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, 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 I'm being for real. Yeah, he's like, I can't take it anymore. 
So she's alive. Um, they like they 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 they're reunited with each other, and I, you know, he goes, you know, and he, I think it like at this point, Denzel knows he's dying. So yeah, it's like it's it's not really an unfair trade because they're not even going to get a chance to oh, torture yeah. him to death. I think he's been a dead man walking like since the kidnapping. Honestly. Yeah, like it's he's, like yeah, he's mind. on borrowed time. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then Dakota Fanning and Denzel Washington always always tear up a little bit at the end. When oh, she goes, she goes, I love you, Creasy, and she goes, you love me, don't you? And he goes, I love you, Peter. Yeah. And then, like, they say their goodbyes, and he he walks to, to his own execution mm-hmm. as as Peta is reunited with her mother. Um, they get away, and he gets he gets into the car with the kidnappers, and just sort of goes to sleep, kind of clutching his Saint Jude medallion, and then mm-hmm. he, he drops it, and then you're like, <laughs> he drops it, and he floats off into death in Tony vision mm-hmm. as, as, as he is like double exposed and like his colors get desaturated. And, and then we get two of the funniest opening yeah, and closing credit cards. So like, yeah, uh, I, I would like to imagine that this is what death is like. You just go into Tony vision. Yeah. And oh, like, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, two of the, well, and, fake Enya plays. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I'm like, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, maybe it's not so bad. Yeah. Then the movie ends. And as you said, has a, Two of the most insane and hilarious like end title cards in a movie I've ever seen. <laughs> the first one is like in memoriam. It, it's on the screen. We see John W. Creasy, January fourth, nineteen fifty six to December sixteenth, two thousand three. An obituary for a fictional character. It's so great. Like it's a like gravestone kind of. <laughs> R.I.P. La- this movie is dedicated to Lance Corporal Jesus H. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Killed during Desert Storm. <laughs> uh, and uh, th- then we see, like, and then we see uh, Giancarlo Gianni, uh, Gianni. He kills the voice. And then we get another title card, the end card that says, the man known as the voice was killed during the course of his arrest. Yeah. He was just executed by Giancarlo. Yeah, who and shoots then, him like 12 times in the head before he falls over. It's really sick. The best end title card of like any movie I've ever seen. So passive aggressive. <laughs> as, and, as a, you, you, you spit it here. The last yeah. thing we see closing out A Man on Fire is... Okay. A special thanks to Mexico City. A very special place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the kidnapping capital of the western hemisphere that paired with the opening title card is of like there's a kidnapping every hour here (laughs) (laughs) a special thanks to mexico city sorry for portraying you as like the ninth circle of hell and like every every mexican as like a corrupt child murderer who would gladly sell their mother for like twenty dollars and honestly i think like the trivia thing of like yeah, you're you you and your filming crew were targeted for kidnapping. I think that was probably the police playing it up yeah. a little bit, like trying to be like trying to like uh, try to try to like uh, no, fleece kid- some more money from yeah. the big Hollywood film production. Nah, go kidnapping to is City. so real here. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah, it'd be a shame if someone kidnapped you. <laughs> but, you know, we, unfortunately, we do offer a quite a, 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 a wide host of uh, kidnapping insurance. Uh, by the way, here's our lawyer, Mickey Rourke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that is. A Man on Fire and Deja Vu, Tony Scott and Denzel Washington. But no need to stop there because there are many other Denzel Washington and Tony Scott movies for you to take advantage of, starting with Crimson Tide, as you already mentioned. You've yeah. Got, you got Denzel and Hackman mm-hmm. facing off with each toe other. Toe to toe. That is a very good movie. Yeah. Crimson Tide is off him. Then you get um, Taking a Pelham 123. Another amazing movie. And then, and then Tony Scott's final movie unstoppable mm-hmm. the train movie which is yeah. like uh, i i think they taking a pelham one two three is probably like the off one for me like i enjoyed it but like the original is just so good that like it's hard for me to, i like, still haven't uh, seen the original we gotta watch that it, <laughs> yeah. it's the best it is the best new york city movie ever made oh like, shit. yeah it, it is the original taking a pelham one two three is that's that's a five bagger masterpiece but i guess like uh has any any closing thoughts on tony vision and god denzel I think that all these movies are sick and you'd be well well served watching all of them. I think like I think like Crimson Tide is kind of the Cold War one. You know, Man on Fire is kind of the Iraq War one. Deja Vu is kind of the 9/11 one. Yeah. Uh Taking of Pelham 123 is kind of the, the like financial Bloomberg crisis. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Financial crisis, economic crash one. Yeah, yeah. The Occupy Wall Street one. And then Unstoppable is about, yeah, like our current crisis of just like degraded infrastructure yeah. and uh, derailed <laughs> trains. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, like I like Tony Scott's movies in the 21st century, like very much like mirror the kind of um the the dreamlike fantasia of like American paranoia and disaster. 
And um, best of luck. Uh, try to stay out of uh, Tony vision as much as possible. Yeah. Unless you're getting ready to kill someone. Yeah. Unless you are a, d- a middle aged dad type <laughs> figure who's, uh, who's about to about to get real. Yeah. Th- whose shit is about to get real for. Her. Yeah. But yeah, like uh, Tony Scott, like I said, like uh, just to see his evolution as a director and like just how much his style has like uh, truly evolved while like never, never really like just developing and like pushing further like techniques that like he, he advances in each movie. And like, yeah. you know, he remains like Tony Scott remains, I think like the, the true auteur of popcorn, like action thrillers yeah. and Denzel Washington, like one of the most, uh, reliably great leading men of of our era. Oh yeah, and like the two of them and their collaborations together, I think like really reached like some true heights of movie magic in the twenty first century. Mm-hmm. True movie mindset movies. Final thought. Uh, I remember I watched Crimson Tide with my grandfather, who was a Navy officer in World War Two in Korea, and he was very offended by the ending because he was like. They wouldn't let someone like Gene Hackman be the, be the captain of a nuclear submarine. He's too unstable and racist. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, I've heard the way you talk about Japanese people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that does it for Tony Scott, Denzel Washington. This has been Movie Mindset. But uh, stay tuned because I think next time we're returning to one. We're Mr. going to Rourke Mickey. mode. We're going Rourke mode. We're returning again to the films of Mickey Rourke. So till next time, stay watching movies. Bye. 